Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here on a late winter's day. It's the end of winter, right? I guess we're right about to hit spring. There's no spring training, no baseball, so it feels a little weird. But there are no off-seasons in wrestling, and there's so much crap to talk about. Crappy people, crappy wrestling, and even some good stuff. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. It's about 37 seconds into the show right now, and here is the star of the show, Mr. Jim Cornette. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. Well, Jim, we have a big action-packed show with lots of topical topics. How are you feeling today? (laughs) Ah, the only thing I disagreed with that you just said was we're going to talk about some good stuff, too. I don't know if that's gonna happen in the program but i'm you're like a wind sock on that intro you're just <laughs> flapping slowly in the wind topical topics and tropical illusions all this and so much less awaits you on this episode of the drive through i wanted to i didn't want to take over the program brian right at the start of things people have accused me of of trying to commandeer to to uh, to take over to overthrow if you will and stage an insurrection on your show here every week and just just take off with it run away with it and so i was trying to give you the opportunity to hang yourself early i guess i was giving you the opportunity to speak that was my first mistake well i want to thank everyone who got in touch and expressed a concern about you staging an insurrection of the show <laughs> Jim Jericho, we'll call him now. The insurrectionist. Well, it is like 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 Terry Taylor told me that time when he was trying to fucking mealy mouth uh, shit stain out of heat for uh, sabotaging uh, the entire crew to uh, Miss Dixie Carter after Jeff got sideways with her when he systematically went through everybody and Road Dog and Savio and they finally got to me and Terry's like, "Well, it's Jim." I said, "Well." It, it, I didn't go into business for myself. Everyone agreed that was what we were going to do. He said, but yes, but sometimes people just don't want to disagree with you. (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck? I've never had an issue with disagreeing with anybody. But we have a fine listenership out there, Brian, and the cult of Cornet and the Legion of Last and all of the, the various people that support our programs. And, you know, we've been doing some some uh, audience participation bits, I guess, as Carson and McMahon would have termed it lately, that uh, just came up by accident. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was the the why is my on our sponsor spot, and then people started taking that question a step further. And then we, we had some guys talking about it, and then we had the the female side, I think, on one of our recent programs. And at the same time, there's a segment that we just did that's that's already sweeping the nation, as they say. I think on on I, it was just this last week's experience, right, where we talked about a variety of ways that you can animal husbandry with the gerbils. Oh no, I thought this was a one and done. It's, We're returning to the gerbil talk. Well, no, well, that's because on my show, people are steering us in that direction. They what what they've done is they've combined our recent audience participation bit that we've been doing with the scintillating conversation and explanation and background and history of and dissertation on the practice of gerbiling that we did the other we other day on the program uh, one of the listener, actually a couple of different listeners. What did you call it before? Animal husbandry? Animal husbandry. <laughs> See, that takes into account the, the fostering and the the care and, and feeding of and relations with the animals. If you could talk to the animals, Brian, and learn their languages and maybe take a platypus to lunch or whatever. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but now as i'm trying to get this out here you're yeah, taking over 
Let's You're taking serious. over your program. Let's be serious. Uh, let's be serious about these gerbils because a couple of our listeners have, uh, in, along the same vein, have combined these two subjects, and we we got a double header today. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, because it. <laughs> And this is also kind of a course, a dissertation, if you will, in how changing one key word can pop up slightly different things because the two questions from the two Cult of Cornet uh, listeners that were asked of the Google search machine, you type that into your Google there, and, and the Googler gives you the top. In this case, we got one, we got eight. Uh, the two questions were, why does my gerbil... And why is my gerbil? See, there's a very important distinction there. I'm glad that when, multiple people have gone into action to <laughs> numerous answer these questions. People, I'm telling you, it's sweeping the nation. It's a it's a popular, a highly popular thing to do. We're going to have to do an omnibus by the end of the year on the why is my. It'll be called Declawed. The gerbil omnibus. <laughs> Somebody tweeted, and the the gerbil died of a cocaine overdose in his ass, quote unquote, was not on my bingo card for a line <laughs> on a podcast in 2022. They're calling us in, sweeping the nation. Sweeping the nation. Time. Yes, <laughs> you forgot to sweep your office for bugs. Anyway, so which of the two questions, Brian, would you like to hear the answers to first? Why does my gerbil or why is my gerbil? I don't really feel comfortable picking one of the... Like, if there's a trial, I don't want it to be pointed out that <laughs> you were fine with this. You picked one. You have a coin? In, in that case, why does my gerbil? I'll just go over these quickly. Why does my gerbil? And the answers you get are, number one, why does my gerbil nibble me? That's kind of innocuous. Possibly the gerbil is hungry, you're not feeding it enough, or it's it's just little love bites, whatever. Let's remind the audience that whoever these gerbiling people are, it's a incredibly perverted, deviant subsect of society. Well, no, For no, most no, people, wait, gerbils no. are a regular pet i would assume i don't know i wouldn't have no, one. These, these are no you're 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 mis you're completely misinterpreting this routine brian these are legitimate gerbil owners asking these questions these are not the hardcore gerbilers that have the <laughs> the tube from the paper towel roll what? and 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 have the duct tape around the the the, the claws and and are actively turkey basting the poor little Jesus creature <laughs> these oh. are these are legitimate <laughs> gerbil owning americans now well, i assume people of all stripes and race even in the ukraine wherever around the world these are gerbil owners oh leave the ukraine out of questions. this leave ukraine not the ukraine leave ukraine out of it well they, well they've got there they have a right to have gerbils too putin ain't gonna take the gerbils god damn it looks like a gerbil that's why he wants them. Anyway, so this, these are quality gerbil people here. These are not the perverts. Don't accuse. They, these are fine little, cute little furry animals and their owners. So the, number one, why does my gerbil nibble me? Number two, why does my gerbil squeak? Possibly that's their method of communication. One would think that a small little thing like that would have a high-pitched voice. Here's one that might be a concern. <laughs> Why does my gerbil pee on me? Now, right there, if you've done something to the poor little thing that, that has insulted him and he responds with, I piss on you. Or could that be a gerbil expression of affection? I think there are various animals that don't respect the idea of being held by a human and will just piss whenever they want, wherever they want. And if you're lucky, there's not going to be shit involved, too. You've had about four of those, haven't you? I have not had any gerbils. You, no, I have not. No, I'm just talking about those little creatures that just intermittently piss and shit all over you. <laughs> I have four uh, of those, yes. Yes. My so, little tax okay. deductions. Speaking of four, number four. Why does my gerbil stare at me? Now that would give right. you... That means it's safe. That means it's safe. I like that one. What do you mean it's safe? If it's staring at you, it ain't up your ass. Well, it wouldn't. 
I told you we moved past these okay. reprobates, but it, it <laughs> might have some plot in mind. If it's staring at you, we don't know. Gerbils may be of a higher intelligence. They may have some plot in mind that there's the wheels are turning as they're staring on how to take over the household. You never know. Why does my gerbil, so to recap, because you've been interrupting, we got why does my gerbil nibble me? Why does my gerbil squeak? Why does my gerbil pee on me? Why does my gerbil stare at me? Why does my gerbil keep squeaking? So this is becoming a pattern here. Have you noticed that there are some things they keep going back to? The next one may be a clue as to why they're squeaking. Why does my gerbil have a bloody nose? I didn't know that was a thing. Well, apparently it, it, it made the top six that gerbil, uh, uh, gerbils can't keep their nose out of other people's business, apparently. Maybe they go their, their inserted nose first, which leads to trauma. And here's another possibly a byproduct of what you were talking about, Brian. Why does my gerbil have a bald patch? What was I talking about? Well, it could be that the, the manner and the, 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 the trappings in which are used to insert. Oh, see, you're going there, not well, me. You're, well, I didn't go a there. Bald patch, I don't know. And, and lastly, on why does my, why does my gerbil sleep all day? Possibly was worn out from the previous night's activities. Hey, get a job. <laughs> get a job. <laughs> Wake up. Get a job. <laughs> get out and pull your own weight there. Out of all the gerbils in the world, I got the lazy one. Little Jerry the gerbil. Sleeping but, all day. What, but now, why is my gerbil uh, changes things up a little bit? Please be as why? innocent as the last one. That's what well, I'm going to say. Why is my gerbil, uh, number one, shaking? Possibly <laughs> trepidation of things to come. Why is my gerbil biting me? Now we've gone from nibbling to biting. This is a pattern also. Why is my gerbil digging in the corner? Could an escape <laughs> attempt be? <laughs> it's like I'm not going in there again. I got to get out of this thing. And out here, <laughs> this, this may be an issue now. Like you said, why is my gerbil nose bleeding? So if there are any veterinarians in oh, the cold, Cornette. I know the answer. What? From the Jerry Penicoli story. They're coke addicted. If their gerbils are on coke, they're probably going to get some nosebleeds if they're really fucked up. But how the hell is the gerbil going to get the Coke on its own without its owner facilitating that purchase? Very simple. You have a bunch of Coke, getting ready to have a nice little social outing. Some people come over that you don't want to share your Coke with. What do you do? You put it away. However, you don't put it away to hide it from the gerbil. The gerbil has free reign over that the room. The gerbil knows. The gerbil knows. The gerbil's nose knows. Maybe they can actually pick up the scent. So basically, these any gerbil that has a nosebleed is addicted to cocaine. Yes. Is what you're saying. All right. Well, there you go. Well, well possible. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's a possibility based on previous well, studies that we've talked about here on the show. Yes, the these week. scientific studies that we have <laughs> paid close attention. I think you're right. Now you've you've hit on this thing. And I wonder then, is there a gerbil rehab that that is available? Or are they going to have to tough it out on their own? Well, and, and here may be an answer, but the next item on why is my gerbil after shaking, biting me, digging in the corner, and nose bleeding, why is my gerbil not moving? <laughs> there is no gerbil rehab. You're fucked. <laughs> if your gerbil gets the fucking cartel on its back. Um, I'd like to think these are all in order of what you're thinking. Like, hey, why does my gerbil have a nosebleed? Why is my gerbil sleeping all day? Why is my gerbil not moving? Well, actually, <laughs> we've we've skipped around a bit because some people apparently this goes by amount of times the question is asked, and some people didn't pick up on all the symptoms. Next, why is my gerbil after shaking, biting me, digging in the corner, nose bleeding, and not moving? Why is my gerbil vibrating? <laughs> the gerbil's vibrating. <laughs> And it's drumming its fingers, and it keeps looking out the window, pulling the curtains back, wondering if the Shiite Muslims are outside. 
I know whose story that is. <laughs> I miss Buddy. <laughs> and and next on the list, why is my gerbil twitching? Again, so, it all ties now, in. Wait, now wait, but now number eight. That we got to put these in order here in a second. But number eight, why is my gerbil stomping his feet? <laughs> he, he's not throwing a temper tantrum. He's not putting his foot down about the way things are going to be. He's he's wired. He's wired. So if you put these in order, I think first would be shaking, then twitching, then vibrating, then nose bleeding, then stomping his feet. Then digging in the corner, and finally not moving. What do you think? Sounds like Jerry had the Belushi of gerbils up his ass. <laughs> well, this is not. No, this is not canvassing the people to interview just poor Jerry Pinnacoli's gerbil. This is gerbil owners from all over the world, and now we've uh, come to find out that even if the gerbils are not being the victims of animal husbandry, they're still drug-addled motherfuckers. Is that why Nick Gage looks so much like a gerbil with those rotten teeth of his? Because he's... It, it, I'm just wondering, if does he have gerbil... Does he have gerbil in him? I started to say, that would have been a pun. Does he have gerbil blood? Is gerbil relations? Did his... Did his... One of his parents on his... Mother's side or father's side were, were there gerbils in the family tree. I just want to say for anyone who ever wonders why people like Jim and myself to this day love Dennis Caruso, this all started where Jim just randomly said, hey, you know, Dennis and Frank Chili used to talk about this. And now it's two episodes <laughs> worth of gerbil stories. <laughs> all righty then, but it's your program. Oh, thanks um, a lot. Yeah. I'll tell you, though, if you're worried about just walking down the street and somebody just now, because of the programs we've been doing recently, just randomly holding you down and shoving a gerbil up your ass, you can be assured, folks, that you will not have a gerbil or any other form of wildlife shoved up your ass if you patronize JimCornette.com and the Cornette's Collectibles Store for fine merchandise that there is no fear whatsoever because Fanny and Felcher Featherbottom are doing a tremendous job with the fulfillment. The, the it's flying fly. I'm glad I'm not Kevin Dunn. I would have spit all over everything. Uh, they're flying. The packages are flying out to the customers. And if you go to Jim right stinking now, you can get the autographed, Color 8 by 10s, the Cult of Cornette membership certificates, the autographed copies of Behind the Curtain. So many of the new listeners are discovering the wonders of the Behind the Curtain 80-page full-color graphic novel. And uh, and also, what did I forget? And T-shirts. Don't forget about the T-shirts. But if you go to jimcornette.com this coming Saturday, March the 5th at noon Eastern, on the dot, then the last remaining Christmas variant action figures will go on sale. Uh, and I, there's less than 400 of them. I'm afraid to predict these things anymore. I don't know how long they, they could go instantly. I could have them for two weeks. Who knows? You never know what's going to happen, but if you need one and you've been wanting one, this is your final opportunity. Get in now because these, once they're gone, they're gone, and they will not be remade. Saturday, March 5th at noon Eastern. Somebody tweeted on Saturday, where's the action figures? And I tweeted back March 5th. <laughs> and that's what it is. Noon Eastern. Very dramatic. Well, I've said this many times, many times in many ways. March 5th. In many ways. Noon Eastern. <laughs> All right, well... For those of you that may have forgotten, this is my show, <laughs> and we have a lot of questions, a lot of topics, a lot of topical topics that we have to get to here today on the show, but Jim, first one I want to ask you about, and as we are recording, and we are recording, not to play spoiler, but we're recording on a day of the week, and several <laughs> wait, people wait, have wait, sent- Wait, 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 
We are recording on a day of the week. I didn't want to narrow it down in case the Russians. Well, listening. yeah, don't narrow it down. Well, we don't want them to know our schedule. My God, that would upend the world order. Go ahead. But several people on Twitter, as well as via email to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com, have been sending in questions to the show, as well as you and myself personally, all morning, about recent comments from the former Unabom, the former Kane, <sighs> the mayor of, is he the, it's the mayor of Knox County, not the mayor Knox of Knox County. Well, yes, it's a, it's a unified thing. Oh, okay. Well, Glenn Jacobs, of course, a longtime wrestling star and someone who really got his first break under you in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, where he is now, in fact, the mayor. And he, I guess, put out a few tweets and it got everyone riled up. Got me riled up for a little bit, too, I have to admit. <laughs> uh, before I go to anything that I can pull up here to read, any initial thoughts about all this? Or how aware are you of all this? Oh, uh, rem remind me. Brian, I say this every once in a while, but you don't seem to do it. Remind me never to say anything positive or good or complimentary about anyone ever again, because invariably it leads to disappointment and heartache when they turn out to be a fucking nut too. And I know a lot of people I've... Over the past several years... I have had numerous people at one time or another say, well, what about what Glenn Jacobs said or did, or he supports Trump. I haven't actually seen him out there with his arm around the fucking mango Mussolini, so I tried not to look. Like I mentioned, I think on a show or two ago, a couple of times I've had to fire somebody because they wouldn't let me not notice why I had to fire them, right? And I thought, I just won't look closely. I know Glenn, he's a libertarian. He never said he was a Republican. Even though he ran as a Republican, he was a libertarian. I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. I know it, there, it was in the news here lately that he, you know, the, the irony of him being a masked wrestler who wanted to drop the mask mandates. I mean, oh, God, but I didn't want to delve deeper into that because I didn't want to know that he's another one of these. But he just put it out there. He, he could have goddamn taken out a billboard across the street from my house. I may have been able to avoid looking at that. But his latest tweet got so much derision of fucking backlash, whatever you want to call it, that everybody was talking about it. There was no way to avoid it. I avoided Adam Page's response to him, which was quite clever, because Adam Page has me and you both blocked, because he's apparently is... Because he's the soft heavyweight champion. Well, I was about to say, he's, <laughs> he's as emotionally fragile as, as the people that Kane talks about, but... We, yeah, by the way, we've never tweeted at him ever. <laughs> no. But anyway, but yes, so Glenn tweets, if you on the left are shocked by Putin's aggression, wake up, sunshine. Historically, in the real world, might makes right. Weakness, parenthetically, which is really what the left are all about, is not a virtue, it's a fatal character flaw. And no, the U.S. should still not get involved. Uh, remember when the Republicans were the ones that were against the fucking Russians, against the communists, against the evil empires, except Vince's that they work for. Did you see the second tweet that was attached to that? Well, hold on. I'm okay. dissecting the first one. Might makes right. So does that mean that we, if we wanted Mexico for some reason, that we should just go down and say, okay, it's now South Texas because we, because we can. I think everybody would admit we can take over Mexico if we wanted to. So that means that we should be able to if we want to, because might makes right. Weakness, which is the fatal character flaw, was these people still in this bubble of theirs not seeing that what was the setup on this? Do you remember that, what did Donald Trump get impeached for? Was it the first or the second time? 
The no, first the time. second time. The second time was trying to overthrow a duly elected United States government. Correct. The first time was not giving military aid to Ukraine to try to fuck with them and soften them up. Putin wasn't going to goddamn invade Ukraine while his puppet Trump was around because that would make Donnie dipshit look bad. He just used the, as the KGB says, the useful idiot to set things up where it would be more favorable to where then as they eventually knew Trump was going to lose, they couldn't be lucky in Russia forever and have a guy that not only is obviously a cock holster, but probably also compromised in charge of the United States forever. So they knew that then when the guys that don't like us get in charge, then we'll fucking make them look bad by staging the invasion. But well, the point is, go ahead. What I was going to say, if you remember what the impeachment was, there were multiple people who heard the phone call and the transcript altogether that Donald Trump tried to blackmail the Ukrainian president into digging up dirt on the Bidens in exchange for military aid to help fend off what the Ukrainians have always anticipated would be a Russian attempt at an invasion, which is exactly yeah. what's happening right now. And who do you think gave him the idea? When Putin was giving Trump his instructions for the week, he said, you know, you ought to have that fucking Zelensky fellow over there investigate the Bidens. They're obviously crooked. And by the way, why would you give them all that money when they're harboring these criminals? Because Trump's a fucking moron and he admires these people and he'll believe it. Anyway, nevertheless, back to Glenn. As we know, there's three kinds of Republican politicians. There's a few rare ones that are not normally seen in the wild, like Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney, that not only knew what Donald Trump is and was and was doing, but told people. There are then the two main groups are the politicians, especially that have been around for a while, that know what he is, know what he was, knew what he was doing, and they fucking latched on because the suckers that vote for him would vote them out and vote in even bigger crackpots if they didn't suck up to him because he knew or they knew he had the fucking rubes by the balls. That's one group. The other group is the Marjorie Treason Greens and the Lauren Buberts of the world that had, had a few from my state. McConnell's smart to Trump, but I think Rand Paul and that Massey idiot, I think they actually are on that train. They believe him. They think that it was a good idea that he should be the president. They believe in all this horse shit that the rest of the Republicans spout off, but they also believe in Trump. So you've got the ones that knew what the fuck he was and the ones that actually believe in the fucking criminal. As it pertains to Glenn, I desperately still want to believe that he's not a crooked asshole that would suck up to these gullible hicks and rubes that are on the Trump train, and there's a million of them in Knoxville, just to get elected, just to get votes, which leaves me with the unfortunate conclusion that he actually believes all this shit. And as we've mentioned before, it's ever more disheartening when people that you think in every other way are normal and, and sane and reasonable and you've liked them and you never had a problem and then suddenly they're rooting for Putin. They would rather cheer for the Russians then admit that their guy was a fucking criminal and an asshole and that democracy was restored by his ouster. And they're still doing... When did the whole Republican Party become in favor of the communists? Just over a day, just... They were pissed that Barack Obama was such a better fucking president than any candidate they had could ever hope to be that the backlash got us fucking Donald Trump. Now, they're so upset that fucking Joe Biden beat their fucking orange-haired boy that they're taking the side of the Russians 
over over the Americans. What? Meanwhile, NATO's never been more united. The entire world came together pretty much against Putin. Now, as we are recording news on TV, the Russian oligarchs are calling for peace as the sanction pressure mounts. They've now broken ranks with Putin. So there's your might makes right. <sighs> so, again... With very few exceptions, do not expect me to say anything good or positive about anybody anymore because it just leads to looking bad when the truth is found out about where their heads are at. And a lot of people I know have their heads firmly up that fat, disgusting, corpulent, repulsive, smegma-ridden, fucking wannabe dictator's ass. And, and they. You know what's the worst part about it is they all go around. Do you know what the, when I say the Jerry Falwell shit sniffing grin? I know. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. Yes. Where it's the same one that the preachers have where they look down at people condescendingly and just go, you don't understand what's really going on type of thing because they've figured out the whole God thing and he's around and et cetera. And they look down at people who go, you got to be out of your mind. And they just, they have convinced themselves of the truth of their argument to the point where they just, you just don't understand. And it's the same thing. They can watch footage of these fucking radical right-wing hillbilly militia gun nut God crackpot fucks using grappling hooks climbing up the side of the fucking Capitol screaming, hang Mike Pence and return the election to the asshole that's been fucking things up for the last four years, and they still won't believe it. It didn't happen. It was tourists. They're delusional. They are smoking such hopium because for whatever reason, whatever fringe group of deplorables, that whether they're pro God, anti-gay, pro-gun, anti-normalcy, whatever the fuck, pro-criminal, they can't fucking see what's in front of them. And at the very least, if you can't tell he's a criminal and you don't study deeper to find out the links that he just went to to try to overthrow the government alone, but just hear the man speak. He's a fucking liar. He's an asshole. And he's an idiot. That's obvious every time Donald Trump opens his mouth. And you've got these people that are either following him because in, they have some character flaw that indicates that they agree with the shit he wants to do or... In worst case, this only applies to politicians, not the voters. The voters are just stupid, gullible suckers. The politicians that know what he is and what he's doing <clears throat> and what he's continuing to try to do to threaten to run again in three years, and they won't tell people the truth about it because they're scared they'll get voted out. That's the worst part. So whichever one glens in, fuck it. I'm sorry. I'm done. That would be me washing my hands of Cain at this point. And I think that's what it is. I do think he's a big ignorant idiot who took a lot of chair shots and who knows how many times he was concussed and he's getting older. We'll oh, yeah, well, that, that, that was Adam Page's tweet. In responding to Glenn's tweet, he tweeted the Ukrainian relief charity and being able to devote to, devote to, donate to children and then, and by the way, here's the 10 hardest chair shots Kane ever took over the head. And video, one right after the other. Bing, bing, bing. He tweeted something else. Yeah, he tweeted something else. But what I wanted to say is I think part of this is just his ignorance, but I also think it is pandering. I don't think he's done. I don't think in his mind he's done. I think he wants more than Knox County, Congress, Senate. Who knows? I don't think this is a guy who said, I'm going to give up my wrestling career, even though it was at the end. I just become the mayor of Knoxville. I think he wants more. Why not? And, and I think and that's why he has the social media presence he does. into retirement. And I think you, that's why he does this on social media. 
Who the fuck wants to go to Washington? Here was a second Jesus tweet. Christ. I highly doubt Putin cares a whit about toxic masculinity, the cancel culture, Mutawa, or any of the other things the radical left stands for. What is a, 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 a Mutawa? What did you just I, say? I don't even know. M-U-T-A-W-A. I thought it was Masawa at first, but I Is that like Kofefi? Not. Or what did, what, <laughs> was he something, was he trying to say a real word? Hold on, let me look it up. Mutawa. Uh, the religious police in Saudi Arabia, whose duty it is to ensure strict adherence to establish codes of conduct. So what? The cancel well, culture police, I guess, in his eyes. Oh, for God's sake. Oh, boy. <sighs> anyway, there you have it. Another one bites the dust. No surprise. No surprise with this one, unfortunately. He's exposed himself plenty of times in the last few years, and this one I think is finally I can't everyone look who he sideways. I can't, I can't look away. They will dangle it in front of me. Every single one of them. <sighs> well, perhaps we can go back to better times when he seemed normal, when he looked like Sid, <laughs> when he seemed like he had the potential to be a great guy. Maybe we can go back to those days where he was Unabom. We can get a nice painting made that you could hang in Castle Cornet. You know, that in happier times, that would be the caption. Where there, there he would be in the Unabom outfit and I'd be pointing at him and... We'd be smiling instead of him being a nut. That's what you can have, folks, if you patronize our friends at Paint Your Life. You can have a painting on the wall of the way you wish people were instead of the asshole way they really are. Whether you're making new memories, holidays, vacations, getting out and, and making new memories with your loved ones or memories from way back, way back, Brian, way back years ago, uh, of different generations of your family, all these things can be turned into a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photograph and at an affordable price, as we mentioned, from one picture or a combination of pictures. Put generations, different generations that never coexisted, all together in the same painting. You could have, you could have Glenn Jacobs and Nikita Khrushchev and Groucho Marx. Ayn Rand. Or, or possibly Karl Marx. <laughs> Ayn Rand, whatever the case may be. Choose from a team of world-class artists and work with them until every detail is perfect. You can receive your portrait in as little as two weeks. And as I said again, send any picture, yourself, your kids, family, a special place, a cherished pet, even an action shot. That's what it says. I wonder what kind of action. Folks, if you've been getting some action and you have some pictures of it, they can make an oil painting out of it. Or your children playing your favorite sport. Or their favorite sport. Do you make your children play your favorite sport even if you don't, if uh, they don't like it? Well, this makes the perfect birthday anniversary or wedding gift. Or you can just let them stop playing that fucking sport. Anyway. <laughs> All right. It's meaningful, it's personal, and it can be cherished forever. Forever. These things last. I'm telling you, you'll be dead in the ground with pushing up daisies. These things will still look lovely. But it's a great gift for family members or people you want to piss off and show them how good you look. At PaintYourLife.com, there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now is a limited time offer. Get 20% off your painting. 20% and free shipping if you text the word DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, to 64,000. That's 64 with three zeros. DRIVE to 64,000. 20% off and free shipping. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Message and data rates may apply. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. DRIVE to 64,000. That's right, and we're going to drive to another question in a moment, but I have to say, in looking at Glenn Jacobs' tweet, some of the people who retweeted it, I'm looking at some of the comments here, these are pretty funny. Starting to understand why The Undertaker tried to burn him down as a kid. Oh! Might makes right, huh? My man went from corporate Kane to Gestapo Glenn. 
I like this one. Wow, just when you thought you heard the worst from a MAGA GOP scumbag, here comes some more unimaginable shit. <laughs> and here's a quote from Mick Foley in 2018. We didn't know the long-term effects of headshots and concussions back then. And I guess that's where we'll wrap it up and we'll see what else happens with the mayor. But Jim, another popular topic, and it actually happened last week, but it happened after we recorded the show, so we didn't get to really talk about it. But recently, Dax Harwood did an interview on Renee... What is her actual last name that she uses now? Renee Paquette. Uh, Paquette. On her show, which used to be the Oral you Sessions. You know what? They missed a great opportunity to name her show Hot Paquette. Well, it used to be the Oral Sessions, but I guess they've thought wiser of that. Now it's just the <laughs> after, Sessions. After Max Caster's rap, I think they probably put in a change order on that one. But Hot Paquette. I think that would be perfect. Well, there's still time, I assume, but recently on her program, she had Dax Harwood of FTR, AEW's FTR, and he had some comments about Raw 25. Now, we talked with him about that actually on The Experience a few years back before they went to AEW, but he didn't share these details, I don't think. Let's no. go to this. I'm going to read you this quote. Let me know what you think on the other side. Now, if you remember, Raw 25 is when FTR were destroyed by Hunter and his friends. The clique came back together to destroy the top heel tag team that had just come up from <laughs> NXT. For a lot of guys, it's like, oh, it's a paycheck. Who cares? But not to me. There's a legacy I want to leave. But that happened. And I talked to Sean. That was the first time we had talked since the Performance Center days. I told him, man, this happened. Tore my bicep went through a really dark period, and thought I was going to quit, but thankfully, I have the greatest wife in the world, and she has supported me, and brought me out of this funk, and out of this dark place, and I'm here now, I'm super happy. He said, I was the same way. I was in this very dark spot in my life, and I was watching Nitro, and I ordered the tallest girl I could see. No, hold on, let me go back to this quote here. <laughs> I was in this very dark spot that my wife, she's beautiful, she pulled me out of this dark spot, too. You and your partner are way too talented to be doing what you're doing tonight. You are way too talented to stay at this point. Just keep your nose to the ground and keep grinding, and you'll get over. And I said, oh, Sean, thank you so much. We had this bonding moment. And then we get in front of his friends. X-Pac, Hunter, Billy Gunn, Road Dog, Scott Hall. And as soon as we got in front of his friends, he started making fun of me and making fun of my situation, and what happened with my bicep. I was like, man, I just poured my heart out to you, and as soon as we get in front of your friends, because we're going to go over that they're going to beat the shit out of us, you decide to take all that stuff and make fun of me about it. And then, this caused, I believe, that day when the story broke, Bret Hart to trend on Twitter, because a lot of people said once again, see? Brett was the good guy, not Sean. He's still the same way. And that's how you and I are specifically... Who the fuck has ever said that Brett was the bad guy out of Brett and Sean, except for Sean and or The Office? Nobody else really, did they? Some people have looked differently on him. They think he's a different guy today than he was back then. But when you hear a story like this and you hear about this experience for Dax, especially that position in his career, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, that's what I would have expected to hear because, uh, uh, Michael, the whole group that you just mentioned, except and, and poor Sean Waltman, he's like the, you know, the nicest guy in prison or the baby face member of the, you know, fucking terrorist group or whatever. But most of them. And he actually, they, let, me, let me just jump in and specifically say there was another quote. He pointed out that after they did the angle where everyone beat them up, the only one that came over, and he said this on our show too, the only one that came over and shook their hands and said thank you was Sean Waltman, which isn't yeah. a surprise. So I say Michael's in his group, I'm talking about the main instigator perpetrators, they treated everybody like it was so childish. It was, it was like they were the high school football jocks in the teen movie that were going around being dicks to everybody in the locker room when they were grown adults in their 30s at that point. And that's why I, I, 
have always said I didn't understand why Vince put up with it or how that this whole thing came to be and that these, you know, pilled up goofballs could be running rampant. But, you know, and then everybody said, Shawn Michaels changed, you know, he had the time off and then he found religion and everything. You know, when you used to be a dick and then you find religion, to me, that invariably means you're a dick with delusions. You used to be a dick, you're still a dick, just now you're a dick with delusions that there are invisible supreme beings. Anybody that was a dick beforehand generally is a dick afterwards. And some people are going to say, well, Luger, Lex wasn't a dick on purpose. Sometimes he just came off as a dick. But I never found him to be a dick on purpose, at least not to the level of these dicks. Some of the biggest dicks that you would find in the wrestling business. Um, so I'm not surprised at that statement at all. I don't, you know, I, I just wish that it was, it was Dax, right? I just wish that Dax would have known better than to try to have a honest conversation with this goofball when he was near his childish boys club treehouse friends. If he'd have been alone, he might not have said anything about it, but he was with all of his buddies. And it says something too about backstage problems and morale problems there when this was happening, Hunter's involved. Obviously at that point, Hunter was still alive. Also, Sean is involved. Oh, God damn. Sean was God Hunter's damn. best friend. Wait a, oh, wait a minute. Oh, Jesus. At that point, Hunter was still alive. I mean, Hunter was still there. <laughs> you didn't realize what you just said. He's still alive, ladies and gentlemen. Or so well, we're being I led to believe. you were just speaking figuratively. Maybe I was. We will never find out. But the point is, Hunter, someone who was an executive there, was involved in that whole thing. Obviously, it was probably his idea, quite frankly. <laughs> Sean, who was a big muckety-muck in NXT, is involved in that thing. And he's the one doing this. Like, to me, and I know it wouldn't happen, that's a firing offense. You're not someone who's supposed to be doing that. That's not your role. If you're going to be a trainer, if you're going to be a producer, do that. But to turn around and do that to talent? Well, th that also just showed, again, if this was the still the professional wrestling business, FTR is the best in-ring tag team in the, in the business, and companies would be fighting for them, like the Midnight Express was getting offers from people all over the place to fucking do whatever, because they're valuable. But in the land of you know, fucking sports entertainment. And they'd probably already got the word from Vince that I don't like those guys. All they do is wrestle. They remind me of Blanchard Anderson. If he remembered who Tully and Arn were. And then they go to the only other viable company in the fucking country. And it's run by cosplaying middle schoolers that are jealous that these guys are real wrestlers and bring them in to bury them. They've gone from the frying pan into the fire. But it's obvious that if Sean and Triple H and all those guys were fucking around with them then, that they, you know, they didn't have any serious plans for them. And it's, it's a shame. That's why there are not... If we all, we're always arguing and bemoaning and bitching about why there's no more, or not any more than there are great pro wrestlers in the world left these days. That's because... If, if in a lot of cases, if they have talent to be great professional wrestlers, they're run out of the fucking business by the trampoline jumping gymnasts and the goddamn assholes that want entertainers. Yeah. All right. Well, Jim, another hot topic happening in the world of wrestling, a big rumor going around. No one knows exactly what is going to happen yet. But I guess it's balls to the wall this year for WrestleMania. <laughs> the rumor going around is Pat McAfee potentially working a match with 78-year-old Vince McMahon. I don't know whether that's balls to the wall or trust to the crotch. <laughs> um, <laughs> God damn, I wonder. Vince's balls may be down to his knees by this point. He may have to require special... Do they make wrestling tights to hold in the apparatuses and appendages of near 80 year old men 
Um, I think there'd be a lot of sway and swiver and blowback around that these days. Uh, I, I saw this, and unfortunately, I believe it, too. I, I, it's not preposterous to me because it's, it's going to be preposterous, but the idea that this is being talked about and potentially planned and happening is not preposterous to me because they do need all hands on deck. They need every major name that might appeal to a wrestling crowd or a wrestling audience that they possibly can get and I know they've also said, oh, but it's going to be all smoke and mirrors. I don't care. At this point, it's, even if Vince comes out, does my old deal, does end of which I, I didn't invent this, by the way, it's the oldest manager deal in the world. Oh, come out with a fucking arm and a sling. I slipped in the shower. I'd kick your ass, but I'll have my, I'll have my boy. Maybe that's what Shane's going to do. I'll have my boy kick your ass. Even that, what does it say when it, it, it's not a secret Vince's age and it's also not a secret that he is, if, if I can't say it, looked infirm recently, then not the commandeering presence, the commanding personality, the booming voice, the whole, the barrel chest that we came to know and love as Vincent K. McMahon, this is, even if it just walk, I, I guess cosmetically he still looks good because he's still a maniac that does the training with his personal trainer at three in the morning and all that stuff. Yeah. That's going to be the weird thing when it looks like a really great fit guy from the neck down and from the neck up, it looks like the oldest man you've ever seen. <laughs> and, and then if he talks and he's like, yeah, and, <sighs> and let me, my grandson, Billy. And then, but unfortunately, his grandson's name is not Billy. And then there you go. And <laughs> see, if you watch South Park, that'd be just fucking hilarious. Um, but I, just, yes, he's 78 years old. And in what universe, Pat McAfee, again, he was, I don't know why he hadn't been wrestling more. I guess he doesn't want to, but he had the stunningly good debut with Adam Cole off the smack or off the uh, NXT deal that they did. And, but he's a pro former pro football player. Who's approximately 40 years younger than Vince McMahon. So even smoke and mirrors, why, why make Pat McAfee? I don't know what they're going to do. If it's somebody else that McAfee gets to fight, that's one thing. But if in any staged conflict of any description with Pat McAfee against Vince McMahon, you've pretty well, you know, destroyed McAfee's aura as any type of athlete if he was competitive. And here's the thing. I don't know whether this is Vince's idea or whether it's the idea of some closely underneath, you know, writer or stooge or, uh, you know, family member, whatever, maybe it's Stephanie, who knows, but somebody has said, well, Vince, you're the biggest name we've got, you know, and of course Vince would agree with that. And it, it's a fucking very small little goddamn group of big names they've got to pull from, but it, it, they are, is his inner circle still convinced that Vince is the, the guy that he used to be and comes off visually and etc the way he used to be or is it just Vince himself and this is his idea and and nobody's been strong enough to talk him out of it I don't know but can it can it be anything else but kind of embarrassing to or sad at least to to do something like this now it's finally caught up to them that they haven't made enough stars that the booking, if we're going to call it that, the creative, the writing, whatever you want to call it, good or bad, whatever you think of it, hasn't created stars. And then you get to the point where you're desperate and you booked yourself into a giant arena for two nights. This comes across like a desperate move. It comes across, it comes across like a really bad idea. The guy's 78 years old. I don't care what kind of shape he's in. It's a bad idea. I think if he had a capable inner circle, there would be a lot of different decisions made for WWE. But he doesn't have that right now. And certain people are there just because of their ability to 
Please, Vince. Let's be honest about it. That's the only reason they're there. This is a really bad idea. And, and you know, if you're going to do something with McAfee, I feel like it's a waste of McAfee, too, to tie him into this. And then you think about who you're putting 78-year-old Vince in the ring with. He's had two matches in front of people, McAfee. Even, you know, even if he means well. And he's going to take care of an 80-year-old man. I'm not for this in any way. I'm not for Vince being in the ring. But if they are going to do this based on the little bits of Raw that we've seen, do you make Austin Theory his partner? You make it a handicap match? <sighs> okay, hold that thought for a second. Because first, let me ask you this. If they book one-on-one -on -one Vince McMahon versus Pat McAfee, and then there's a switch in the arena and somebody else wrestles McAfee, no matter who that is, that's that's a letdown, isn't it? Oh, that's I want a refund, maybe. If you build up yeah. a Vince McMahon match for a month and then it doesn't happen, that's a problem. So then it becomes, you know, a, they've got to do something. Even with smoke and mirrors, Vince has to be active in some kind of way if they advertise that for that to play out, right? One would think. Yeah. Or elsewise, it's going to just be real bad. It's like the like the head shaving that doesn't happen, kind of bad. What you just said, Austin Theory, do they put him, is, is he Vince's partner some kind of way and make it a handicap match? Well, then, Theory is good enough that, and, and McAfee has trained hard enough and is, was diligent enough in that because he came through, he can... I guess it was rehearsed, I'm sure, et cetera, but he can do that well. So he, in theory, should theoretically be able to be just as good or better than him and Adam Cole. But the question is then, if Vince does get in even in the manager spot, when, when McAfee is down to get some heat, well, maybe he can do that. But then that really makes it hard if he can't, at the finish, McAfee can't make a comeback and can't bump Vince. And do you want Vince taking any kind of bumps, even if it's a safe worker? Much less, again, McAfee, you know, it, it's WrestleMania. It's a big stadium. He's only had two matches in front of people. He may mean well. Does he? I mean, he's, he's everything Vince has is 80. 80 years old, for fuck's sake. Anything could fucking snap. He tore two quads at the same time 20 years ago, rolling into the ring in a fit of peak. You know, the only bump I would even consider having Vince take, and I still think it's a bad idea because of his age, but if you really wanted a bump that kind of tied into everything, possibly take the stunner. And even that, I wouldn't trust him taking at his age. Well, Rene, he couldn't take it when he was fucking 60. <laughs> that's true. Remember, that was the worst fucking stunner bump of anybody. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Except maybe Linda. Did they give Linda the one one time? That's right, um, Linda was really bad too, yeah. Yeah, but otherwise, Vince couldn't ever get it. Couldn't get the idea at all of, you know. Here's a, a question. How old was Mae Young when they put her in the ring and that one multi-woman match and at one point she got off balance and got dizzy and almost just fell across the ring and fell out of it and they were like oh my god she's 80 whatever we shouldn't do that we shouldn't put somebody in that position she was was she six or seven years older than vince at that point or maybe four but it, at this point Good God. And again, even if even if he doesn't get hurt, it's a say it's worse than Shane McMahon going toe to toe with UFC fighters because at least Shane is is only in his early fifties. And Vince is and and Vince in his mind, I'm sure, still sees himself like the old Vince and Maybe some of those around him still do also, and maybe some don't, but does, I can't imagine that anybody would think that this was a good idea if Vince is going to get physical, and if they're going to bait and switch it and swerve it into a handicap or somebody else taking his place, then I don't know why anybody thinks it's a good idea because I don't think the people will like it. Well, just to keep you informed on everything, Shane McMahon posted on Twitter 
He was in Madison Square Garden, and here's a picture of him there. He's carrying a tray of drinks. I guess he's selling them in the seats. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but here's a, he's in the garden, and it says, Walking in the hallway at the garden with my three sons for the New York Rangers game, and past this, and it's a frame photo autographed of Hulk Hogan, or maybe not autographed, that's something else, but it has some memorabilia there, because Hogan's a big star in terms of MSG history. And he said, Made me think, Hulk Hogan, got one more in you? Oh, good God. So how about it? Shane versus Hogan. We need a main event for night two. Come on. That's a great main event. (laughs) You know what? If they got Austin coming back, they should have had Austin and Hogan against Vince and Shane. They should have a battle royal of everyone who's going to get blown up and injured in two minutes. Just put them all in one match. Well, that's what they've already done that at WrestleMania 17. I was in it. The gimmick battle royal. Remember me and Bruce Pritchard were the two youngest <laughs> motherfuckers in there. And and I thought we'd be safe over in the corner and all we did was potato each other. Get a black out of fat lip out of it. You know what I just saw the other day? And I'm, I don't remember if it was Jericho or Austin or who it was that they tied it to. How old was the Iron Sheik during that gimmick battle royal where he was ancient? Um. Well, that was in the year 2001. And, and the Iron born... Sheik is today is 80, is he 81 or 82, I believe, somewhere around there. He was, it's like six, he's my age. Jesus Christ, we were all laughing. The Sheik is going to be the one to win it because he's so fucking old and crippled up that he can't take the bump over the top. And he was basically my age that I am now when that took place. I took the fucking bump over the top. I can take that bump today. Son of a gun. See, I've retained my vim and vigor and spryness. Knowing the Vince of old, if he does do this, will he accept just having a match? Or will he want to do something spectacular in that match to, not, I hate to use the term, but well, have a WrestleMania moment? It, I, no, it, Shane would be the one that would be dreaming of something spectacular to do one spectacular move. Vince will want to get in there and actually have a fucking fight with the guy. He won't be thinking about one specific move or one moment or one shocking death defying thing. He'll be, he'll want to go in there and fight with a fucking NFL football player. Like it's a goddamn, even Steven deal all the way through start to finish. It won't be one moment. It'll be, well, all right, better get loosened up. I'm going to get down to it here. You know, I think he still, he probably still thinks he can do it. Now, whether they're going to let him, or whether that happens when it comes time is a different story, but I bet you that he'd say, well, I'll just go out there and we'll keep it short, less than 10. <laughs> what the- well, here's another question for you. Last one on this topic, and we'll move on. We'll see how they set things up if they do this for the next few weeks. But just have, having seen him on TV, the way his face looks, and the fact that everyone knows he's old and he is old, is it tough to make that person the heel? Like, he has to be the baby face in a way, doesn't he? Because of that. I mean, how do you get heat when you're, I mean, I don't know. Every time he gets hit, yeah, it's going to be a sympathetic thing. He's an old man. I, well, I, don't, I hope he doesn't get hit more than once, if that. But um, that is a good point because, I mean, you know, McAfee, is, he's got the heelish, you know, braggadocious personality. But at the same time, Vince McMahon, the evil Mr. McMahon, is one of the great characters. It would be like Strangler Lewis coming back from, the, you know, he's one of the great characters of all time in wrestling. How do you, like you said, he should be a heel. The, he's the owner of the evil empire. And the reason why the WWE management is hated by the fans for the last 20 years Uh, But how do you make not just a senior citizen, but an 80-year-old man the heel against a fucking football player? It's just, it's bizarre. And again, I've said a while back that I hate when Vince appears on TV and is mumbly and fumbly and doesn't have the same presence that's going to be magnified, one would think, several times, you know, with him trying to be physical. Uh, it's going to make Flair want to work a match. Oh, 
Hey, uh, again, you know, the only one that's that I think ought to still be wrestling is Lawler because what the fuck? He's already died once. So, and also he's, he's for whatever reason, he's figured out a way to still have his match at the age of 72 and, and get everything in. But, uh, but otherwise, gee, many Pete, it's just, it beggars belief. Well, Jim, we don't know if Vince McMahon's listening to the right people. We don't know if he's hearing the right people. We also don't even know if he can hear anymore. We don't know what's going on with him. But if he actually wanted to hear some, let's say, good music for once, perhaps he needs a good pair of Raycons. Well, that was very abrupt. I thought you were leading me down a garden path and suddenly it turned into a brick wall. But nevertheless, I'll try to make the chicken salad here. Folks, if you'd <laughs> like to listen to what you'd like to listen to, this podcast, for example, that's so highly popular and sought after, or your own music, your own soundtrack, the news, see who the uh, the uh, country that's being invaded today is, whatever the case, you can listen to anything you want to listen to with the Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds. They call them Everyday Earbuds because that's when you ought to wear them, every day. As a matter of fact, when you buy a pair of these, you have to fill out a pledge that you will stick them in your ears at least one hour of every day. There is no pledge. That, well, or in dust, regardless. One of those things. No. But there, you have to have a promise. You have to, you have to promise people, the people at Raycon, they're going to sell you these earbuds for a, a seduced rate, a very low price. It's just, it's a mere pittance. And all they ask you to do is stick these things in your ear every day. The promise goes the other way. You buy your Raycons because you want them, and they promise to deliver you the greatest pair of earbuds. Yes, amazing sound, perfect in-ear fit. The gel tips, they've got the, their optimized gel tips. So they've not only made them out of gel, but then they've optimized that gel. And that's the optimum gel that you can get. There's an awareness mode for when the guy bearing down on you in the semi truck is sitting on his horn and you can't hear now you can hear because there's an awareness mode you will be aware that you're about to die also that's the well it's aware of your surroundings regardless of what those surroundings may be sometimes you may be in a box of fluffy ducks and everything's okay but you'll want to hear them cheap 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 raycons <laughs> offer eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life you can't stay awake that long you can't run these batteries down. You'd have to sleep before they do. And they're priced just right. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands whose names we shall not mention here because they've been consigned to the dustbin of history after Raycon came along. They've got over 48,000 five-star reviews, and that's just from Uncle Dave listening to New Japan Pro Wrestling soundtracks. So right now, my listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E, buyraycon dot com slash J-C-E. You get 15% off your Raycons. Who does not need a pair of earbuds? Well, I guess Mick Foley would only need one. But otherwise, you need, you need a pair of earbuds. You, people need to listen more. They need to talk less and listen more. Well, with these Raycons, you can listen all the time. If you start talking to the Raycons, well, you possibly got a substance abuse issue. Buyraycon.com slash JCE. When you say people need to talk less, I didn't know if you were talking about wrestling shows, but unfortunately this week on Friday night, I watched some of SmackDown. The only segments worthwhile were the talking segments. <laughs> Boy, I... You know, they've hit on a formula. If the first promo segment is good enough, then you'll sit through the middle hour and 35 or 40 minutes to get to the last promo segment, and hopefully that'll be good and send you home happy. And in the middle, you can just do the laundry, wash your hair, clip your toenails, whatever, because it's it's pretty sad. Ah, so you... You watch this. Uh, did you see the revelation 
from uh it was an interview with ronda rousey i can't remember where it was i say it was reproduced everywhere on the internet that the reason she's so smiling and happy lately is vince mcmahon told her to smile more smile and we've been complaining where'd the game face go where'd her badass look go she's a smiling happy little girl come to find out vince again took away the one thing that we looked forward to about ronda rousey the same thing he did to the ultimate warrior actually Got over with kids like me being this maniac running around killing everyone. Next thing you know, he's smiling, <laughs> happy, has a human life. Well, on SmackDown this past week, it was Friday, February 25th, for those of you keeping track, but the opening segment was Michael Cole in the ring with Ronda Rousey. And there were parts of this that were, for once, Michael Cole was wonderful here because he did exactly what he was supposed to do. Yeah, I was going to say that this is the perfect role for Michael Cole. I yeah. can't even complain about this. He was perfect here. He did. He conducted the interview. He held the microphone. He asked questions. And then he asked follow-up questions on the answers. And at the same time, he's the one who was reciting all of Ronda Rousey's accomplishments so that she didn't have to. If, if they want her to be a baby face, she can't come out and brag on herself for 15 minutes. That's his job. To put her over. List her accomplishments. So, and, and with a normal baby face, the all shucks kind of thing, you know, works with Ronda Rousey, though. It, so I like what Michael Cole did, and this was a template for how to interview a baby face and announcer and stay in the interview and stay in the ring. Not thank you for introducing me. You're dismissed. It, it looked like it was legitimate, but the problem again with Ronda Rousey to me, her appeal was she was the baddest bitch on the planet. She arm barred all those girls in the UFC in a minute. She had the game face coming out. If she was Rousey mania for a while, it was it was everywhere. But the look, the attitude, the aura you got from her was she's the baddest bitch on the block. She's going into these fights, right? That's what was appealing. And those were real fights. So, yes, she had the game face on. But why did she change in wrestling? And obviously, Vince told her to smile. And I've heard... I've heard Vince say it, and I've heard the people under Vince say it. Well, we need to give them personality. Flesh out their personality. Show we don't want one-dimensional. Show other dimensions of their character. No. It, that's what led uh, Goldberg in, what was it, 2003, to wear a blonde wig. Because they wanted to show other elements of his personality. Flesh out his character. Give him more dimensions. No. We don't want dimensions. <laughs> Do you want dimensions to goddamn Rocky? Did you want dim did John Wayne need dimensions when he was the sheriff? Does fucking if Bruce Willis need dimensions at Nakatomi Tower? Ronda Rousey, the baddest bitch on the planet, has the game face, comes out with fucking Joan Jet music, beats people quick, looks wins decisively. Same way Goldberg. Spear, jackhammer, headbutting lockers. We, we didn't want to see him wearing a fucking wig. Now we found out by her own interviews as well as the television program that Ronda Rousey, she was defensive. This was the word. She, she was defensive when she came back because she was afraid the fans were going to boo her because, and she didn't want to get booed, but she thought they were going to boo her because of the things that she said when she left last time that she apparently meant and wasn't working to get heel heat because apparently she's emotionally fragile in the same way she cracked up when she lost one fight in the UFC. She takes it to heart when the fans boo her and it hurts her feelings. So now apparently the baddest woman on the planet we now know is emotionally fragile. And so, Brian, my question that I'm asking you after she did this promo where she's talking about, well, she broke her hands, then she had a baby. But her mother was a badass, and she wants to set that example for her kid. Okay, that's a nice baby face story. But have they lost complete sight of why everybody was crazy about Ronda Rousey to begin with? And now she's just a giggly little girl who gets her feelings hurt. 
other than the fact that she is Ronda Rousey and everything that encapsulates the star power, the name, the reputation, this was kind of brutal. And there was nothing about the person out there other than it being Ronda Rousey that would cause anyone to, I don't know, get behind someone. It was awkward. Yeah. She couldn't get any lines out. You say Michael Cole was reading her accomplishments. It was his role. I don't think she could have done it. Well, no, she couldn't have got that out anyway. And that's that's one of the roles of the interviewer. I've been in that situation plenty of times. You get out the information that the talent will not be able to convey clearly or quickly or whatever and and so yes you know that part he did fine but like you said if it had been any anybody else but ronda rousey who was already a star you'd think well geez that's it was my first interview on memphis tv right it was like <laughs> what's he doing here this clearly doesn't fit on the program she just you know <laughs> She's a smiley, happy little girl that wants it. Now she's living her dream, I guess. Everybody's happy when they come to the WWF to live their dream. That's the same thing Steve Austin said when he came in. Remember, it's always been my dream to be here. I'd work here for nothing. But uh, I'm just saying that what all the things that made Ronda Rousey stand out as a shoot have been taken away from her. And now... And you mentioned at the Saudi Arabia show, because the girl, they all she wore the karate gi, which looked good, and the absolutely no makeup look, which made her look 14 years old like she just rolled out of bed. But what is the deal with the gimmick binoculars eye makeup? That's what I was saying. I was so happy she didn't have in Saudi Arabia, the monster makeup. I don't know what that look is, but especially for her to be a baby face, talking... Like a human out there, not talking like a wrestler because, you know, she can't really do a promo like that or she hasn't. It's really a weird look and I don't get it. And I, I, think, it, I, I think it turns off fans, actually. I think it's, there's nothing well, babyface about it. Because, and I mean, again, she's Ronda Rousey. She's a shoot. She's, you know, really a, a real fighter Pinocchio. So it's done, it's not like she has to stick to all the rules of tan you know, <laughs> but she's translucent skin color with the black circles around her eyes that remember you used to be able to get the gimmick binoculars in the back of the magazine for $5.99 or whatever. And then you'd tell your friend, hey, look through these binoculars and they would and it would make their fucking eyes black. Anyway, she wants to be, Rhonda does, the first woman to tap out Charlotte. And they showed pictures of the interaction in Saudi Arabia where Rhonda had her arm tied behind her back or by her side at various points, and Charlotte was kicking the shit out of her. Well, she wants to get even for that, but wouldn't you know, the mention of that brought out Charlotte. Dripping, just dripping bitchiness. And she wants to be the first one to tap Rhonda Rousey out. And I thought she did a, a good job there as a condescending heel, uh, you know, and the making the mockery of her, et cetera, going to send Rhonda home to work on baby number two. But while, while Charlotte did a good job with that, it's almost like now they've got it. They are giving the, the vibe off that, Ronda Rousey is being bullied by this smart ass heel and all these horrible things being said about they've got Ronda Rousey being bullied. It's like, a, and she had the pout face, the boo-boo face kind of like, how dare you say that to me? But before we got any physicality between those two, Cruella DeVille suddenly appeared and attacked Ronda Rousey from behind. So, it was fine with me that Cruella DeVille was a representative of WWE management and working alongside or underneath or doggy style or in whatever position she's working with Adam Pierce. And it was even fine when she was verbally berating one of the, the talents, Naomi. And she was obviously, you know, not a fan of Naomi and trying to hold her down. But now that she's just coming out on live television and physically attacking Members of the roster, is it 
safe to say that the time has come where Cruella ought to be relieved of her management position if this was the case? Well, Vince is too busy training for his comeback. <laughs> all right, well, all right. So Charlotte pulls Rousey out and wraps her knee around the post a couple of times. They're getting heat on her. And then Cruella's going to do something to her, and Ronda monkey flips Cruella with the good leg, and Cruella rolls out of the ring. Charlotte had disappeared by that point, and that's the way it ended. So Ronda Rousey, the biggest mainstream female star on the roster, has been attacked by a member of management and one of the other big stars on the roster, and nobody cared enough to try to stop it or help out in any way. But then once that Charlotte did her damage to Ronda and Ronda was still able to monkey flip Cruella, Charlotte had completely disappeared. Cruella didn't want any more. Ronda ends up in the ring, and they just move on. <laughs> Flattered and four o'clock. Good talent, rotten booking. That's uh, pretty much what I saw. You know, you kind of want Ronda to be the female Brock, in a sense, in terms of legitimacy, in terms of toughness, in terms of star power, but it feels like she's going in reverse. She started with all of that. Yeah. And whether it's her confidence or whatever it is, I don't know. It seems like a different person now than the Ronda Rousey who debuted and the one who started working there. I'm wondering if she just came back to fulfill the contract and she's not really, she's like, eh, eh, I've done this now. I don't know. If that's the case, if that's what you think it could be, who do you put over in that match? Well... <laughs> It's going to be a letdown. I mean, I don't, I don't know what their future plans are. If they've got her for contractual appearances going forward, it would not be good for Ronda Rousey to lose this particular match to Charlotte. Uh, if they're not happy with her attitude, they may check it a little bit and play with the finish and see what happens. Uh, who know, But uh, normally, at WrestleMania, most of the baby faces go over. One would think that would this would fit in that category. They should go all the way with the makeup. If she really wants to wear it, go all dump <laughs> Matsumoto and put her with Shayna. You have two badasses, you have Dump and Bull, and I think they should go with that. Tons of makeup, badasses. I'm thinking Ronda's a Svinguli fan. Oh, because of the eye makeup. Interesting. And she just, she just couldn't get her top hat in in time. <laughs> so, also on SmackDown, have, have, we, have we moved on from... Rouseyville, Browsy Acres. I believe so, yes. Uh, <laughs> also on SmackDown, for those of you who missed it, and many of you did, they also had Kofi Kingston and Big E against Angel and Hubert. Zia Lee against Natalia. I watched that. And did you see the leaves falling for Zia Lee? I did. And then suddenly she starts doing the karate routine and the, the lightning bolts shoot out of her fingertips. Yes, if you were more fluent in karate films, you would understand that's not so unusual. I mean, you could start with maybe The Last Dragon. That's kind of a nice little introduction to the world of magical powers in karate. The leaves or the, or the lightning bolts? Well, both. Both would be under the umbrella of magical powers, I think. If she's causing them, and you're making me believe that she is indeed causing them. But what I was going to say is, I like Xylee. Xylee's pretty good. Yeah. And then Sami Zayn and Johnny Knoxville fucked around there for a little while, trying to make the business look as bad as possible. And just real quickly, at the end of the thing, Sami Zayn goes to give his hell of a kick in the corner where he runs corner to corner and puts the boot in the guy's face. Did you see him miss Johnny Knoxville by just went straight past him? And, <laughs> and Johnny Knoxville didn't realize his foot had gone past his face until about three or four seconds later, and then suddenly went, oh, my God. So they did it a second time. It looked a little better. Yeah, Knoxville's not used to selling without actually feeling the bump. I... Anyway, then Shotzi Blackheart wrestled Sasha Banks, and then we got a twofer. Drew McIntyre had some bit of business with Happy Corbin and then again with Mosh Pit Jones. And that was on Fox Network Television. 
for an hour and a half in between the first interview and the last interview. And that's what they expected people to watch. And then we came to the last interview. The contract signing, the face-to-face -face confrontation between Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns. They are advertising this as such with a beautiful graphic. The biggest WrestleMania match of all time. And as soon as I saw that, I, I wrote, Austin and Rock are on lines one and two. And well, Hogan is not necessarily very happy. Hogan Andre may be number one, I think. Well, if you want, are we talking biggest in terms of money, most widely seen? Hogan and Andre was the most widely seen pay per view, but pay per view was in in its infancy at that time. Yeah. I think how many homes? Well, it was a ten buy rating, which was an insane percentage, but. It still wasn't as many homes as, as Austin and Rock would have done at WrestleMania 2001. But even though that wrestling has never been more popular, viewed by more people on one given night than that night, the gross over the past few years may have gone up because of all the price raises and everything. But I think it's safe to say that for legendary status, most eyeballs or biggest gross this WrestleMania match doesn't qualify for either of those. No. Having said that, there's Adam Pierce in the ring with security and a table. So right there, there's a red flag. The, the gerbil is twitching and stomping its feet and digging <laughs> in the corner. That's your, that's your fucking, your early warning signs that something's going to happen. Here's a here's a question for you. Where is all this security when anything else happens for any promotion? Excellent question. From what I understand, they're all stationed outside Goldberg's dressing room. And if Goldberg's not there, they free up to work on other endeavors yeah. to potentially protect people, which they rarely do. Of course. And again, because it's overused, you automatically smell shit when it's held in front of your nose. Bullshit. But it's, it's still, still, the the art of booking is establishing your rules and the logic of your universe and the way that things happen and then working your shit around that so that it appears real and credible and organic. When you establish that you don't have any security in angles where nobody comes out to do anything to help in any way, then it's glaring when the security does come out and vice versa. So there doesn't have to, you don't have to start in the ring with security like they've been doing lately. And have you noticed every time they do something on one show, they do it on the other, show, even in the same company, they do kind of so, sort of something on raw. They'll do kind of sort of something like it on SmackDown and then they'll kind of sort of be something like it on AEW. But if your security is in the building somewhere and, and unscheduled things happen, then it takes them a minute to run out, I understand. Or if they start in the ring, then if you've established you've got them, then they have to be available when something happens in another segment in the same show. It's just, it's just insane. It's so, there's such a lack of effort put into tying up any of these things that it, that's why it's lazy booking. Anyway, so, but Paul Heyman and, and Roman Reigns and the Usos come out and Reigns did his acknowledge me gimmick and Paul E does his, the carnival Barker spiel and put it over as the biggest ever and mentioned Hulk and Andre and mentioned Austin and Rock and gave it the big build up and explained as best he could that security was here to protect Brock Lesnar from his own impulsiveness and from Roman Reigns. And then, because they'd gone so long, they knew they had no main event match, it's a main event promo, and they needed another commercial break. Did you love Paul pitching to the break when he said, the security is here to protect Brock from his own impulsiveness and from Roman Reigns himself? And he says, and that 
is what they call a cliffhanger and snaps his fingers and they go to black and go to the break. That was incredible. I'm so happy they let him do that. And here's the thing. It was fuck it it was cute. It's prearranged as all shit that the heel manager should be able to dictate when the network TV show goes to break, but that's the kind of shit that when somebody talented does it and it's clever, it would get over better if everything else wasn't so fake around it. So I I enjoyed that. I like that. Uh, but then they come back from the break and here comes Brock. And have you noticed, he must always be freezing to fucking death. I know he lives in Saskatoon or wherever, but no matter what part of the country or the North American continent he's in, he comes out in multiple layers of warm clothing. What's going on? Do you think his blood circulation is substandard or what's happening there? He's like the opposite of Bruiser Bedlam. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't know what's going on with it. I mean, he used to turn red during his matches, Brock. We haven't seen him do that in a little while, but who knows what the problem is? Well, you know, maybe it's it's just blood circulation. But Brock like, says, you go, know what, go ahead. I was going to say, you know what I like to think it is? I like to think it is, I'm not going to the hotel. I'm not doing anything. You tell me what time I have to be there. I'm going to fly in. I'm going to go right <laughs> to the arena. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to keep my clothes on. I'm going to get right back in the plate and fly home. You know, it probably is now that I think about it. That's probably what he left Saskatoon yeah, in. Yeah, how could we get you to work more days? I don't feel like changing. I, yeah, <laughs> I I'm just not going to change clothes. Do this. It's like the Don Fargo gimmick when they were the Hells Angels and the chain gang. They'd just ride the motorcycle, show up, come in in the fucking outfit, work and leave, <laughs> never, t- never shower. Anyway, so Brock says hello to Mr. Acknowledgement and Mr. Dick. Uh, and, and he introduces himself and the people get with that because he's doing Heyman's thing. and. I love the way that Roman Reigns sells this shit that's just a little bit different. He's almost like Pacino in a gangster movie where he's sitting there at the at the head of the table and he just he's gritting his teeth and he you know you see it in his face but he tries not to move and in every when that one time he went on the table like that like I've just I've had all I can stand I can't stand no more. But basically Brock says the only thing stopping him from coming over the table meaning Brock is Brock himself and this contract because at WrestleMania, I'm going to kick your asses and get paid for it. And he signs the contract and pitches the folder at Reigns. And <laughs> Bad Heyman again jumps in with the disrespect. How dare you act like this? And then Paul is telling him that it won't be a unification match at WrestleMania because Brock is going to lose this coming Saturday night at Madison Square Garden. Have you got your ticket for the Garden yet, Brian, by the way? Oh, no. No, no, no. Apparently, a lot of other people haven't either. I have. I just saw somewhere that the advance, what, less than two weeks out, was like less than 5,000 tickets paid for Madison Square Garden. So they got an issue there, but... And when obviously there's a lot of smart people that still ain't going out with a bunch of people not wearing masks in the middle of a pandemic. But since other events have been drawing better than that, one would think that that is still a problem. Who's going to be the opponent at Madison Square Garden? It was going to be Lashley. Lashley's hurt. Now they're just saying he's going, Brock's going to be defending and Heyman is saying he's going to make sure it's a good opponent. Are they going to give... Brock and Roman, a little test run, a little day in court at Madison Square Garden and do a non-finish, but let him get some time and some ideas in and give the people the biggest match of all time? Or are they going to feed Brock somebody else and he's got to beat him pretty convincingly? What do you think? I think let's go for the biggest match of all time. Brock versus Cody Rhodes. Hey! Of all time. I don't think Cody will agree to put anybody over that early into the run. Now, come on. But I, I'm thinking they may do Brock and Roman as a, as a WrestleMania preview and announce it in the building so that it's not uncomfortable for their... Vince doesn't like to advertise the same thing in two different places. That's why, in the especially in the glory days, the pay-per-view main event was always different than what they were, almost always different than what they were able to see in the houses. And some, and we found out with Hogan and Flair, if Vince puts it in the houses, sometimes he doesn't intend to put it on pay-per-view. 
But in this case, they wouldn't have to promote the same match in two different places if they just surprised the people in the garden with it that night and then do a finish to get out of it where nothing really changes in their situation. But that runs the risk of the New York fans who are notoriously uh, in ill moods most of the time. They might fucking turn on that. I don't, you know, but I, I don't think they can give them anything else. It's not a cheap ticket to go to the garden. You know, it's going to be an expensive day if you're going to go there and you're going to bring your family and take the Long Island Railroad. God forbid you're going to drive in and park. It's going to be a disaster. So you got to give people a real reason to come out. And, you know, I know they've been mentioning it on TV now, which shows you their desperation, but they, they, they don't have a main event they've announced other than Brock will wrestle someone. Yeah, and and not only an expensive ticket, but I don't care how much it costs to get to downtown New York City from anywhere is an experience that I would be happy if I never have again. And that's my goal in life because it's just fucking miserable. And like you said, the parking, the boys used to have to pay 20 bucks a car to park in the 90s across the street from the gardens and then tip the guy an extra 20 to make sure he didn't block you in so you could get out of there at night. So I can't imagine what the fucking people have to go through. I it, it, That would have to be a hospital giving out life-saving medicine for a, an illness with which I was afflicted before I would go to Madison Square Garden on purpose, to be quite honest with you just to see something and not to work. So that's a commitment. That's how we can get you back to New York? Book it. Okay. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as Madison Square Garden is giving out life-saving serums for an illness that I have, I'll be back there in a heartbeat. But anyway, so <laughs> Rain signs the, signs the contract and cuts the promo on Brock. Everything is mine. It's my show. Everybody here is mine. They work for me. The announcers, the referee, these fans, they're all mine. You're in my show now. And as a matter of fact, everybody here is mine, including the security. And then these eight or ten indie guys that have dressed up in black as security ominously walk together and turn and face Brock like a united <laughs> front. And I'm like, no, seriously, they... They've gone through this whole fucking thing and been serious. Brock's serious. Reigns is serious. Paul is serious in his own way. It's a, But now we're expected to believe that the WWE is a an international fucking billion-dollar conglomerate organization, but they somehow let Heyman hire 10 biased security guys, whatever. Okay, I will... I will bite the bullet on this one because this was the best 45 seconds of wrestling television that I've seen in years. Because this is how you get over. Brock said, okay, and destroys the 10 security guys. And who was it that they did a security angle on a show here recently where everybody ran oh, yeah. at the guy at it, it, it ten. one at a time in turn. It was 10 from the Dark Order. That's right. I was on AEW and they all ran at 10 and it was, and they were, oh, goddamn awful. This was chaos. This looked like the Attitude Era. You could see Steve Austin or The Rock or somebody in the ring. You could see the old Mr. McMahon with the shocked face. Brock Lesnar created chaos he destroyed these 10 guys he turned over the table he threw the chair at one not just a metal folding chair but a big giant goddamn desk chair probably squeaks now as a result of that and picks the table up and runs into three people with it and throws the other one over and he suplexes that one and pitches this one out that's the best example of a guy going nuts in the ring and an angle like that that i've seen in years and it was fantastic. And that's the kind of thing that can build interest in seeing a fucking match. So I'll, I'll buy the loophole there in the middle that Heyman arranged the security and blah, 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 because they produced. That was, that was worth, that last segment was worth, you know, fast forwarding through the most of the rest of the show. What'd you think? I really liked it. And they all, 
seem like serious wrestlers. Like all the other segments that I fast forwarded through with the Madcap Mosses and the Happy Corbins, it's like a different universe than this. Brock Lesnar is like the greatest King Kong ever. Yeah. <laughs> like even when he's a baby face, you still think he could possibly just eat you. You know, so you just kind of yeah. keep your distance. And when he just started destroying everyone minutes earlier, he's smiling. He seems to actually be having a good time. And he probably is. The one person he enjoys working with is Paul Heyman. He's working with Paul Heyman. Yeah. Him and Reigns have worked together enough now. I'm guessing they enjoy working together. You know, I'm not a big Usos fan in the ring, but I think part of that is just the way they've always been used. Yeah. And that we've seen so much of them. But when you see Heyman there in the suit, Reigns at the table, and you're right to point out just all the things he's doing, he's always in the game. He's sitting in a chair. We've seen him like just standing there while Heyman talks or sitting down before. Everything he's doing, every motion, every face movement, he's in the game. And then the Usos behind him look like a couple badasses. But for some reason, it doesn't translate into the matches, for me at least. But I well, love that's the because you can't be portrayed as stooges for the top guy and as a top tag team in your own right. Now, if it was a horseman type of group where they were... Flair was clearly the the leader of the group, but everybody was an individual in their own right or a team or whatever. But no, they've they've either got to be the flunkies that Reigns is, you know, nemeses. Is that the plural of nemesis? Nemeses <laughs> uh, get over on or take things out on. If you say it like Dusty, it becomes a word. The nemethes. Uh, that they get over on, take shit out on, uh, the Usos interfere on his behalf, but they can't be the ta top tag team champions, heel team at the same time. It, it doesn't work in both spots. But it all looked good, except for, you know, the security. I mean, it's not just the fact that I know a little bit, but sometimes you could just tell, like, oh, these are wrestling students. Yeah. <laughs> you know? As soon as you see them, you see the baby faces, you see them standing there. You, you know exactly, like, oh, they're from the whatever school is in that. They town. got a certain look, and yeah. then, especially when they're trying to be cops. Security guards <laughs> is one thing. Security guards, like, being a fucking crossing guard at high school, you don't have a ton of authority. But when, the, when they dress them up as actual uniformed police and they're standing there with the, you know, scared to say boo to a goose, the body language is they're the most petrified police officers, they're scared to be on television, whatever the case, then you know it's a gimmick. So here we have the two champions in this big match, you know, the two top guys. So you'll have them come out of this. We don't know what Brock's schedule will be. Brock seems to be working a lot. I know it's always been only, he only works so many days. If that's the case, did he just use up all of his days? He's on like every show now. So, well, but he, but he, I mean, I know he has to be physically there, but I would think that possibly, or maybe it would be different when you just have to come out and talk for five minutes as opposed to doing a match. So here's the problem. So you have Brock, who may not always be there, may not always be active. Roman Reigns, top guy. After that, I don't know. I'm not ready for a Drew McIntyre run again. I don't see a lot of guys, and I'm using him as an example. There aren't a lot of guys I see ready for either one of those two. I mean, Cody Rhodes, we'll see what they do. It seems like they're, based on what was on Raw last week, maybe they're setting him up for Edge. But it seems like WWE... Again, they're going to Steve Austin and Vince McMahon for WrestleMania. They really need to do something about developing guys because they're only going to be able to do this Brock and Roman stuff for so long. And here's, would they be crazy enough? Call me crazy. Would they put Brock over in the garden to reward all the people that came and then have the rematch and put Reigns over at WrestleMania, but then they have robbed WrestleMania of the unification match that that wouldn't sit well with the old Vince. I don't know what Vince is thinking these days because he con contradicts what the Vince McMahon of the nineties would do on a regular basis. And I'm not talking about because oh, everyone learns and evolves. I'm talking about his basic rules of life that he would never think of deviating from. Uh, do, do not stand anymore. I want to see how he'll react if this garden show doesn't do anything. If the tickets don't move, if they don't get a respectable house in there, how's he going to react to that? Because now they've actually been mentioning it on TV. Well, and, and, and that was the first sign that they desperately want to make a statement with the Garden. And I saw somebody say, well, it's because AEW drew X amount of people in the New York market. No, 
it's deeper than that. I th- do the young people know? It's it's been out there before, but do the young people know that one of the natural laws of wrestling that Vince McMahon, Vincent Kennedy McMahon, learned from his father, Vincent James McMahon, was as the garden goes, so goes the business. That was his measuring stick. That was his early warning indicator. That was his the whole thing. As the garden went, the entire business would follow. And that's back in the days, yes, of the territory where the garden got the big matches first, but then they'd eventually filter to Philly and Boston and Baltimore and wherever. But down deep, Vince still, I believe, feels that in some way. As goes the garden, goes the business. And when he sees the garden flat on its ass, he may be seeing his business there in a year or two. Because, let's face it, we think it sucks. Because the product is the shits, but they're still making money hand over fist. But that might not always be the case, especially if the garden is an early indicator like it was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s. You know, the garden right now in a lot of ways is more representative of the WWE's audience, I would think, than the classic garden audience. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the price of going to the garden. You go watch any old Madison Square Garden footage, and I know you and Weasel Dooley would shit on it, but if you would get (laughs) past that for a moment and look at the makeup of the crowd, it was working class people in good seats. Those were the they were the eight and nine and ten dollar people that would come once a month, and that was the most important thing in the world to them. And it's the same. It was the same thing in the South with the five dollar people, because the tickets were only half as as much as they were in the Garden back then. And the the wrestling business prospered by not only keeping those people loyal and faithful for their entire lives, and they would bring their kids, and they, their kids would bring their kids, but also it was affordable to them. And they the business flourished because of the mass numbers that wrestling could get. And again, like everything else about wrestling, that has completely done a 180 and now there are for the people who say there's this big resurgence in red there's a big resurgence in the interest in the wrestling business from some of the same people that wanted to be interested three or four years ago blah 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 there has never been a case where there were fewer individual people in this world watching wrestling and spending more per head on it So it's the exact 180 of what the wrestling business for decades and decades was founded on is that hook as many people as you can and keep the tickets cheap so that they will come back over and over again. Well, I've just blown your mind. No, I mean, it's a sad indictment of where we are today, but unfortunately that's across the board. I mean, you go watch baseball games from, years back, not even all that, I say not even that far back, 30 years ago is far back. <laughs> Go watch from 30 years I ago. I socks that age, come on. But you see working class people, and that's not to say, hey, we don't want you to be able to come and bring your family, but, you know, they started looking for people who were going to come and bring their entire family as opposed to people who were going to work hard and want to buy a ticket and maybe go by themselves or maybe go with a buddy and hang out. It completely changed the makeup of the crowd, and it's not just wrestling, it's all sports. But Jim, you know, all wrestling and all sports start somewhere and grow, kind of like a seed. Oh, God. <laughs> and I'm sorry for setting you up <laughs> for the worst layup of all time, but I well, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, folks, since you may be as confused as I am, <laughs> about where we're going. I actually know it just, I got no help in getting there, but you know, sometimes it's a gut feeling, Brian. It's a gut feeling about these things that are changing. Your gut can change too with the gut feelings. You need to keep care of your gut. And it turns out, Brian, I don't know whether you were aware of this or not, but it turns out that everything you think you know about probiotics may be wrong. No way. It's true. Everything? Everything. 
Damn. And since I knew absolutely not one goddamn thing about probiotics, apparently I was in the right, but I was still ignorant of the facts. But there is good news because there is a company of, of an entity, a group of people called Seed, Seed, that have a daily symbiotic that's the real deal. Because everybody knows you got to have some symbiosis with your sim symbiotic. Uh, the daily symbiotic created by the folks at Seed, because not all probiotics are created equal, is a broad spectrum two in one probiotic plus prebiotic. So you got the probiotic, and then you got the prebiotic. So you got the pre and the pro, and they're all together two in one. So you get both pre and pro <laughs> at the same time. It's a proprietary <laughs> fo formulation <laughs> of 24 distinct probiotic strains. And I didn't know that there were 24 strains of probiotics. I actually didn't know that it was possible to strain a probiotic. I've strained, I've strained my muscles. I've strained my milk one time, but I've never strained my probiotic. But there's 24 distinct probiotic strains in scientifically studied dosages. Because if you're going to take a dose of something, it should be studied scientifically beforehand. There's also proprietary engineered two-in-one capsules that protect probiotics through digestion to ensure delivery to the colon. Now, folks, again, delivery to the colon is an issue for everybody. <laughs> if you want to make sure that you have proper deliveries to your colon, first of all, people with narrow driveways or twisting driveways that have to come through an entry gate, like I have problems with my deliveries all the time, UPS, FedEx, they can't back those big trucks into that small. If you don't have a big opening, then deliveries to your colon are going to be more difficult. And then you've, you've got to keep the back door open. If you have a, if you've got a long carry from where the truck stops to where the back <laughs> door is, and then to get all the way into the colon to have this stuff delivered, you know, make sure you move the furniture. If you've taken a probiotic before, and never felt a difference, it's likely because the good bacteria was not surviving your GI tract. Did you know that the GI tract can kill <laughs> the good bacteria? Maybe, See, the, maybe the gerbil ate it. <laughs> well, because yeah, again, gerbils, you know, especially if they're, well, if they're on coke, they shouldn't have that bad, bad appetite. <laughs> But seed is designed differently, and that's how it works because it survives the GI tract. I know my my uncle Cliff, he had army infantrymen in his GI tract, and they would mow down anything. But regardless of what kind of GIs you're using, is surviving a, an entire lineup of GIs is difficult. But what does the daily symbiotic do for what? you? You're asking me. Well, I'm telling you, it supports benefits in and beyond the gut. Seed will support ease of bloating. I've never had any problem becoming bloated. It's very easy for me. It's almost effortless. No, I understand what they're saying. They're going to ease the bloating. So if you are bloated, folks, if you, if you look like you've been floating in the river for three days or you're going dressed up as Chris Jericho for Halloween, <laughs> you might need to have your bloating eased. Also, it, it, the, the daily symbiotic from our friends at Seed provokes, provokes, promotes healthy provokes. regularity, healthy regularity and, and ease of evacuation, if you know what I mean. You know what that means. You're not only going to be regular, possibly you might be unstoppable on this stuff. And boy, I tell you what, it's not going to be any problem dropping the Browns off at the Super Bowl and letting the fudge monkey out of his cage. This this stuff, it's like you've drunk a quart of motor oil. It'll grease and just shoot right out your orifice. Is It'll be so easy. You'll never even know it. It'll fall out without you knowing it. No, that's not how it works. You will be in control of your bodily functions, but it'll certainly help if you do have things like bloating. It'll help ease things, but you will be in control. Let's make sure we stress that. Well, sometimes I could just, without taking this stuff, I can barely get to the toilet before that fucking uh, chocolate rocket's being fired off. So if this helps, I may be, I may just be just walking around, just evacuating. 
talking to you. You never know about these things. It also <laughs> supports your gut barrier, your skin health, your heart health, and micronutrient bowel movement. Oh, no, micro, micronutrient synthesis. I skipped a line there. It was, micronutrient yes, bowel movement? No, apparently no such thing as a micronutrient <laughs> bowel movement because I skipped a line on this copy. But fi it's important to note that gut immune function is not boosting the immune system. It's about supporting the crosstalk between your intestinal cells and your immune cells. So you can talk between cells. Sometimes they pass notes between cells, but that's only when the guards are not looking. Many well, of you folks will see improvements in your digestion within 24 to 48 hours, which can include bowel movement regularity and eased bloating. You might notice that within a couple of days. Some of you will notice an inability to eat solid food for the rest of your life after this. But that can be easily fixed no. with our special liquid diet that we sell separately. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> So, <laughs> all right, keep going. I give up. <laughs> I'm coming back in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, start a new healthy habit. <laughs> I'll mute myself. <laughs> So start a new healthy habit today. Healthy habits are very important to start. Visit seed.com, S-E-E-D.com, parentheses, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a slash or a parentheses? There's a slash and it's in parentheses. No, I don't think you need to use the parentheses. I think it's just okay. the word drive. Seed.com slash drive and use the code drive to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. That's an awkward way of saying I think you're going to get 20% off. That's Seed.com, S-E-E-D.com slash drive. Jump on this stuff and get this 20% off while that's still available because I have a feeling once they hear this, it won't be for long. Again, start a new healthy habit today with our friends at Seed. And also, you'll get this box. I got this box, and it's got two containers in it. One is a, a jar of the daily symbiotic, and another is a tube. It looks like a test tube, and it's green, and it's it's got a screw on top, and it's labeled bacteria. And to be honest, I've, I've started taking the symbiotic, and that's why it's amazing. I've lost... 40, 50 pounds in the last 36 hours. It's amazing. No, you have. But, Don't even say that. Of course no, you have I'm sorry. I'm just kidding there. But this tube, this test tube is just labeled bacteria. And because it's a green glass tube with a, a screw on top and it's labeled bacteria, I'm thinking that you should keep this part at home. Because if you try to fly with this stuff, you could probably get sentenced to a federal penitentiary for trying to take active bacteria in nope. a test tube on a plane. Don't worry about traveling with your seed. And of course, seed comes with well, directions on how to apply and how to it use does. seed. It, it, it does come with all the directions and you can travel with your seed. You can travel with your seed. You can spread your seed all over the place if you want to. We want to thank seed for becoming a sponsor of the show here. But Jim... <laughs> Thanks, P. We want to thank seed for their fine speed. seven days of sponsorship. <laughs> Well, let's go from seed to speed. Jim, did you see that Jeff Hardy this week let it slip in an interview backstage at one of his concerts that he's going to AEW even though his non-compete isn't up yet? I, did, I heard that recounted. I did not see the video clip, but I've also heard later on that somebody said that he probably didn't know that he was being videoed when he made that admission. Is that part of the story oh i did not see that part of the story i could research that but did it look from what you saw like that he knew that there was a camera on him when he was saying this these things it didn't look like anyone was hiding that they were filming but to be fair from when i saw it last week it looked like jeff hardy was kind of looking at the person he was talking to which was directly in front of him 
away from the camera, so he may not have noticed that he was. And there was a shameless eavesdropper nearby with electronic surveillance equipment waiting for this admission so that he could spread it all over the internet like revenge porn. That's now seems to be what the story is. Well, it's probably just an iPhone, if I had to take a guess, not serious surveillance equipment. High quality surveillance equipment. That's what it is. Any. No, but, but nobody can keep a secret these days. I mean, what, how hard would it have been if somebody asked him backstage at his concert or whatever if he just said, hey, I'm going to take some time and think about things? It's not like that this is a shocking revelation. It's not like that as soon as everybody heard that he was gone from the WWE, that it, well, he'll be an AEW momentoodily. That's, you know, where else was he going to go if, number one, to make some money, I'm not saying draw money, I'm saying make money. All those guys are being paid, regardless of whether they're the ones drawing it. And reunite with his brother, and because. You know, what are the executive vice presidents, two of the three remaining of the company? They're Hardy Boy cosplayers. So, of course, they're going to be all about bringing the Hardy Boys in so they can beat them like they do everybody else. I bet you they'll even put the Hardys over the first time just to make it look like it's not a goddamn assassination plot. So this is not shocking, but why would Jeff admit that to anybody in a concert locker room, in a Wendy's bathroom and a you know loves truck stop what why would you say that out loud when it hasn't been announced properly and nobody knows exactly how it's going to take place i have the quotes here from when jeff was talking he was talking with a youtuber named jared myers apparently i'm going to aew hardy said i'm so excited until this morning i didn't really know i'm so <laughs> nervous and excited and then in talking about WWE, he said, They released me and tried to make me go to rehab, but I'm just so over it. My dream match was with Roman Reigns. I've talked about that many times. But then I said, So you want me to go away for like 28 days just to save my job? No, Hardy said. You know what's important to me? Family, my two daughters, my wife. They believe in me. Fuck WWE, man. <laughs> it's like a private, personal thing. I'm not going to fucking go to rehab. If they believe in me, that's all that matters. My wife and my two girls. Well, there it is. Well, and, and, and also, we, as we just talked about a week or two on the show, he passed the drug test they gave him. They, <laughs> For those of you who might have missed this segment, after Jeff wandered off in the crowd to take pictures with the fans during the finish of that match and they accused him of being impaired they made him take a drug test but they didn't wait for the results before they said either you go to rehab or you're fired and as a result he said fuck you i'm not going to rehab so they fired him and then he passed the drug test the results came back oh he's fine he was just being weird or whatever probably didn't give a shit so Obviously, he's mad at him. They are figuring out a way to not so much the top guys that have been there for 20 years, but most of the guys, the WWE is figuring out a way to, if not outright antagonize them and make them pissed off at the company, then at least doing nothing to engender a large amount of loyalty between these guys that have already been let go or given these goofy names, gimmicks, and their friends who commiserate with them, one would think that where are going to be the guys that are loyal to this company in 10 years or 15 years that might come back and do something for the WWE like Goldberg is now? They're doing nothing to make these these guys in any way want to. I, you know, I I used to remember some of them would be bullshit like when scott hall uh told vince oh i i owe everything i am to you and and i'm gonna stay with you and i'm going to you can call a meeting and i'll tell the boys that also and then two days later he faxed in his 
official notice so that he could go to WCW in 1996. Some of them are always going to be like that, but I remember guys who legitimately wanted to be with the WWF for the rest of their life and wanted to finish their career there and didn't feel like that they should wrestle for anybody else. And the opportunity was always there and they had a great relationship with Vince or whatever. Now they're just running them off right and left. They don't give a shit. And guess what? These guys might not as be as big a stars in 10 or 15 or 20 years as Goldberg and Austin and all these guys they've been bringing back are now, but who are they going to have elsewise? That's going to be the stars that they got is the, the ones that they're all pissing off right now. They're going to be the only ones left that aren't too old to get in the ring in 20 years. So, I, you know, anyway, as, as far as Jeff, yes, of course, everybody's figured he was going to go there. I don't think he should have just blurted that out. And again, what did you say? He said he's so nervous and excited. I'm happy for him that anything in wrestling can excite him anymore. Uh, it's been a long time since I was excited about anything. Maybe the last, when I actually thought that Sinclair Broadcasting was going to put some money in fucking Ring of Honor at the start, I was excited. That's been 10 years. But ex not only excited, but nervous. He's Jeff fucking, how long does it, before you stop getting nervous doing shit that you've been doing since you were a teenager and you can do in your fucking sleep? Nervous, I don't, it, as we've talked about here recently, uh, I was nervous when I thought that I was moving outside my comfort zone to do something of a physical nature that might either look like shit or I might fuck myself up, but otherwise, nervous? Hey, I'd be nervous they'd book me against pockets if I was going to AEW. Well, let me ask you this. One last thing on Jeff Hardy and AEW. Looking past the fact that the Young Bucks control the tag team division and the Young Bucks get along with the Hardys and the Young Bucks grew up loving the Hardys and they're going to want to do something with them. Looking past that, how would you book Jeff Hardy and AEW? Would you go right to a Hardy Boys reunion? despite the fact that Matt has really been involved with awful stuff since the moment he got there, and it's never been worse than it is now. Well, he was teleporting. That was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. Now I kind of wish he would go to one of those other dimensions and come back to something now, else. Now, at least then, he was attracting attention for people to scoff at. Now it's just he's there in the stairwell somewhere. Therein lies a problem, the way that they've... And I know that they couldn't have foreseen they would get Jeff Hardy this easily that the other side would just, oh, here, Jeff, go be free and fly away from your contract and go work for these people. But that's the problem with having signed a major name like Matt Hardy, then putting him in matches where you tried to kill him, give him brain damage, and then when you saw that was a bad idea, take him out of the ring and make him a bad manager for underneath talent that is involved in silly segments. And now all of a sudden you got a chance to put the Hardy boys back together. But one of them has been a immaterial goof for months. Remember when I started Smoky Mountain wrestling, I was booking Robert Gibson in singles matches, right? Right. Cause Ricky was still with WCW. Exactly. But did I shoot Robert Gibson into the main event picture because he was still half of the Rock and Roll Express, the most famous, overpopular babyface tag team of the previous 10 years at that point? This was 1992. Or did I just book him on shows in the middle of the card? He won most of his matches. He was in a couple of little personal issues just for him to be involved with and get it and and go over in the end. But he was neither used as a single in the main event picture or was beaten as a single in the underneath matches. He was kept right there because I knew that sooner or later I was going to get Ricky Morton because I knew the way they were using him in WCW he he was making money, but he wasn't happy, and they probably weren't going to continue that very long. So instead of leading Robert Gibson in a different uh, direction, I just kept him warm and a part of the program 
until we could get Ricky Morton. Then Ricky comes in, his partner has been undamaged. But now we could actually sell a, a reunion. And that's what worked. That was one of the first things that really gave the people goosebumps down there in Smuggy Mountain was the reuniting of the Rock and Roll Express. I can understand him using Matt as a top singles guy when they first started because he's a name and has been for quite some time and used to be able to work. And maybe it just, he was trying to do too much of the kids shit and not making them do his shits why he kept getting hurt, whatever. But after that, why turn a guy with a name like that into a flunky, goofy, phony, fucking underneath, flustered, incompetent manager doing interviews in a stairwell. He's got the money, Tony does. If he didn't have anything better for Matt than that, just send him home for six months. And then, boom, now you'd have Matt and Jeff Hardy, and he wouldn't, Matt would not have to be living down the uselessness and the tomfoolery of what he's been doing the past however long. So maybe the only thing I can see, you asked a question, do you bring him and reunite him right away? Of course, you bring Jeff in to fucking, and not in the stairway, do it in front of people. But I unless you think that the massive channel change would kill Jeff Hardy's debut, have the Hardy family office in the ring and Andre Oleolio and every goofball that he's involved with. And have Jeff Hardy come out and say, brother, have you lost your fucking mind? What has happened to you? Come here with me and let's go back to Cameron and talk about this. And he pulls him out and then you hear from the Hardys from Cameron for a few weeks. And each week, Matt seems more like his old self, his normal self. The best interview that Matt Hardy has done on AEW television was when he came out that one week and said from now on he's going to be himself and he was going to do normal shit yeah. like a normal human. Have Jeff rehabilitate his brother from the goofiness and the idiocy and the tomfoolery and the subpar talent. And then they make a splash when they come in as the heart and they're the Hardy boys. They don't have to dress in the same way. If they want to update something a little bit, they're 20 years older, but they're the fucking Hardy boys. They're one of the top tag teams in history. And that's who they are. And the people hopefully would love it. But you've got to, I would think at this point, they can't just reunite and just book Matt and main event matches like none of this has happened. You have to explain to the people that J Jeff, his brother, have finally intervened because he was afraid for Matt's well-being with his foolishness he was doing, and he got his head screwed back on straight. That might work. Well, Jim, let's stay on the topic of AEW. We spoke earlier about SmackDown, which aired on Friday. Did you watch any of Rampage? Luckily, no. <laughs> However, I do have the recap for those of you interested. Sammy Guevara versus Andre Oliolio. Wardlow versus Nick Comarato. He's still around. Serena Deeb against Kayla Sparks, the second coming of Mildred Burke. And. The TV main event on what apparently they've just decided now is their YouTube show, even though it's on national television, Pockets versus Anthony Bowens. Now they're beating the acclaim to death in singles matches. And this qualified... I can't say this with a straight face. This qualified Pockets for the Face of the Revolution ladder match alongside Powerhouse Hobbs, Keith Lee, and Wardlow. So and Ricky they, Starks and Ricky Starks and Ricky Starks. So now they put the three biggest, strongest bull of the woods ish type of guys in the company out there climbing ladders with three other guys. And two of the three other guys is Ricky Starks, who should do a fine job and the mascot. So now they've yucked up the joked up Gaga up their ladder match to determine the face of the revolution. This is going to be a complete nightmare, a four finger stinker. 
So that was Rampage. What, what exactly does that term mean? You say it so often, I've never actually sat and broken it down. What is a four-finger stinker? That means, well, you know how when you were a kid, you used to stick your finger in your throat to throw up to get that shit out of your, the taste out of your mouth or the illness or whatever that you had. No. You get it all up, right? I didn't do that when I was a kid. You were doing that when you were a kid? Well, that's what kids used to stick your finger down your throat and make yourself throw up when you make the gag noise like or the gag motion like, ah, it sucks, right? Well, a four finger stinker is one is so bad you need to stick all four fingers down your throat to make yourself throw it up. <laughs> I did not know that's what that's what that is. That's a that's an old wrestling term. Another one they don't use a lot these days because everybody's afraid somebody will get their feelings hurt if you tell them they had a bad match. Was that the entirety of your rampage review? That's it. That's what they showed on national television. So why nobody else? If they're not going to make an effort, I'm not going to. Give me something to talk about. Well, I'll give you something to talk about. We have received several questions, Jim, about recent comments, staying on the topic of AEW, by former AEW wrestler Big Swole. <laughs> I've got a few here. Let me read an email. This was sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com from Cody in Burlington, North Carolina. As has he moved? I thought he was still in Georgia. Hello, Jim and Brian from the heart of cookout country in North Carolina. Yeah. Their milks their strawberry milk, cheesecake milkshake. Their milkshakes are so good they almost make it worth living in a county with so many Republicans. Well, that's Cody's point of view here. It's obviously not Cody Rhodes. It does ease the pain a little bit. I just saw a quote from Big Swole about Tony Khan smoking her weed backstage. <laughs> Of course, we've also heard of him Wait drinking... Wait a minute, this is going in a different direction. I I, ha I saw the comments about the tooth and nail match. I didn't know she was blaming Tony for smoking all her weed, too. Well, there are several different comments she recently made in some interviews, but let me finish this question and we'll get to uh, the quotes also. Of course, we've also heard of him drinking White Claws with the boys. <laughs> what was the level of social interaction between promoters and wrestlers in the pre-sports entertainment era? Which promoters felt their relationships were only business and was that a common sentiment at the time? So we'll get to this big swole stuff in a second, but let's talk about the issue of a promoter, a boss, a booker, whatever it is, hanging out, partying with the wrestlers. Well, again, there's no rule of thumb. There's no what was it like in the territory days. It was all over the page, as you can imagine, because there were 25 or 30 different promoters. Can anybody honestly see Sam Muchnick backstage smoking weed with Pat O'Connor? Probably didn't happen. Um, can anybody honestly see Robert Fuller not doing anything in the world backstage with the rest of the boys when the <laughs> Fullers owned a territory? No. I mean, it's, so it's from one, you know, from one swing of the pendulum to the other, but in this instance, not it, it, the the promoters, and, and a lot of times more the bookers than the promoters. I mean, you would see Jimmy Crockett out at the at the hotel bar or at the bar in Charlotte with some of the top guys on occasion. It wouldn't be, you know, a every night thing, but it certainly wasn't unheard of. You know, drinking, um, doing legal things in front of people. That wouldn't be unheard of. Probably the booker was more uh, uh, social with the boys than than the promoters were most of the time. Just because there was, the promoter was all office. The boys were all boys. The booker was one of the boys that became office. So there was, there was heat, but always there was also some element of clinging to being one of the boys that especially Buck Robley was noted for that, which is why the promoters all fired him from his booking jobs. Cause he would take up for the boys a hundred percent. And, but then if you were a booker that took up for the office every time, then you'd, you know, lose the boys. Having said that, none of the promoters at that point in time, it's not that they didn't want to be friends with the guys, but it was, friends in a business environment and not gosh i'm so lucky that i'm the promoter and getting to hang out with all of the wrestlers which is the vibe that you get from tony khan 
because again, he has no experience in this world. He's never done this. He's been a fan all his life. What if I, if they suddenly said, Hey, Jim, come be a roadie for the Eagles or earth, wind and fire. Or I'll be, well, wow. I get to hang around and watch these guys do their thing. After I've listened to them on the radio and watched them on TV, all these, you know, whatever, they would be the same kind of thing. Although hopefully I probably might handle it a little bit better than Tony and just go completely off my rocker. And, you know, that's the thing is, is we've joked about him playing with live action ever with real live action figures, but he's in a, he's put himself in a position where he's fulfilling a lifelong dream. So he genuinely wants to be friends with all these people. And I think in this case, usually it was the wrestlers finding out that the promoter was a promoter first and not a friend first. I think in this case, maybe they might find out he's a friend first and then a promoter because that's the way he's been treating them. And in return, they're going to, some of them, some of them are going to be just wonderful people and be friends with him. And the ones that are worth a shit and can draw money and are top guys are probably going to eventually, if they haven't already, uh, <laughs> started treating him like a fucking money mark because they know they can because he's given them the position of power where he feels that they're so important to him. And the only thing that they feel that is important about him to them is that they're paying him. He's paying them. Does that make any sense? From that, Jim, let's go to some of this stuff as it pertains to Big Swole. I have an article here from Wrestling Inc. by Danny Wolstenholm. Well, he'll he'll either stay home or he'll go one or the other. And it has some transcriptions here. Uh, actually, it's funny. Here's an article with transcriptions of an interview that Big Swole did on a podcast, and it has credits to someone else for the transcription. But here is what Wrestling Inc. has credited the post-wrestling as the transcription of Big Swole's interview <laughs> on the Public Enemies podcast. Holy shit from Shinola. This has gone through more hands than the Old Testament. Go ahead. Talking about her relationship with Tony Khan and specifically the tweet that Tony Khan sent out after the first word got out that Big Swole had made comments about the structure and diversity in AEW and Tony Khan immediately criticized her work. Like, he gave me his reason and everything, but my skills were never into question. And it sucks because sometimes, you know, you allow people's personal views to seep into yourself when that should be a complete personal issue because, you know, what people think about you is none of your concern. But it did have me going back and looking at my most recent matches, and I watched my match with Diamante. And I did. I watched a Three Strikes match. But the one right before that, the singles match where she cheated with the rope, that was the money. Excuse me, no. <laughs> I, I, I did that wrong, and I apologize. Where she cheated with the rope, and that was money. I watched it. I sent it to other people in the business that I trusted that actually have been in the ring and stuff. And the proof <laughs> was right there. Okay, all right. I was like, sometimes you have to check yourself. And I feel that's where my growth and my strength is, is that I know myself well enough that, hey, you know what? I'll double check myself because maybe <laughs> it's all <laughs> Oh my gosh, she talks like Scott Steiner. Because sometimes you are in the wrong. Sometimes, maybe you're so clouded up here in your head, maybe you're not seeing clearly, but honey, for clarity, not in this case, I got clear eyes. And let me go a little further here. I wish she had clear verbiage. In terms of Tony Khan, here's the quote. I was like, dude, you weren't saying all that when you were smoking my weed. <laughs> he said that we were friends. And I was like, what gets me upset is that when someone says that you're friends and like, of course he has all the money in the world. He could buy all the schmiz he wants, but I'm gracious enough to give what I have in fellowship, break bread with you. I'm opening up my heart to you. You said that we're friends. 
I called what you. What the fuck? We He's text. a fucking wrestling promoter. What did she think? This was a goddamn lifelong relationship? It's just upsetting because I thought that was genuine. And I'm a cancer in terms of a zodiac what? sign. Oh, okay. I was going to see she admits it. I'm a... <laughs> I'm what? an emotional person. <laughs> she just came out with that. I think it would, I'm what an, does her astrological sign have to do with any fucking thing? I'm an emotional person. And when I let people inside of my heart, when I let people inside of my circle, my family, that's important to me. And for someone to break that line of trust is just, it's unbelievable. It's heartbreaking. Really, it is because I thought we were friends. But damn. And there's Big Swole's... I legitimately was drawing Jim Crockett promotions, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in 1986. But at, at no point did I feel like calling Jimmy Crockett up at home and going, Jimmy, I know we're friends and we got this bond. And I know you smoked some of my weed, <laughs> but I've really got some problems I need to talk to you about. I know, I know we're close. We got this, this relationship. What the fuck? Do you have the tooth and nail quotes? Those are the ones I'm waiting for. Well, before I get there, let me finish up this one and we'll get to that. Oh, because, there's more. Well, apparently uh, she talked, uh, there's more quotes from the same interview, I believe. I don't understand that. Referring to Tony Khan's remark about her in-ring ability. I don't understand that. Like, it just, I feel like it just wasn't necessary. Especially when you're in a position of power, and then, you know, sometimes people with power, they do, of course, make mistakes. But however, I feel like you've been in this position of power for a very long time, whether it be with different sports organizations and everything. So I feel like a certain decorum, you should have it, in a sense. And yeah, especially you shouldn't be smoking weed after the matches with the job girls. And especially, like I said, with the line, and I only say this because during our exit interview, I asked him exit about interview. <laughs> I asked him about my skills. She was working at Nordstrom's. Well, during our exit interview, I asked him about my skills and my wrestling. I literally asked him. I was like, hey, because I was asking why I wasn't on TV for a year because I wanted to have some closure so that I could move on with my life. And I asked him, I was like, hey, what is the reason behind me not being on TV? I'm like, is it my wrestling skills? Do you think that I'm not up to par? And he blatantly just came out and just praised me and said, oh no, that's definitely not it. <laughs> that's definitely not why I'm firing you and not renewing your contract and asking you to go away and not work here anymore. You're, it's not because you're a shitty wrestler. Boy, you're great. We would just love to have you, but we just can't afford it or some, whatever. Is she, is she insane? And it, more importantly, all these people in the business that she runs shit by, is nobody willing to be honest and say, no, your shit was kind of rotten. And people were making fun of it, and maybe you ought to work on it some more. See, that's the thing, you know, just to look at this seriously. If she's saying that she's sending these matches around to different people in the business and looking for feedback, without trying to be malicious, the fact was she was not ready at any point that we ever saw her for national TV. She did not seem to have the basics down. And it's a fair point to make that she wasn't alone. No. And still not. There are others that are not ready either, but they're not the ones that are complaining. And Tony Khan didn't say that he cut her because of her wrestling ability until she, after they had already made nice and had their exit interview. And then she came out and said, well, but there's a big problem with diversity and they're not listening to people and this and that and the other thing. So then what's he going to say? You know what? I even lied to this girl's face and told her, no, you're not the shits. It just didn't work out or whatever. Trying to let her down easy. And now she, the, again, it's not the space or the place of the walk-on or the extra in the movie to complain about the director. It is not the place of the water boy on the football team to complain about the coach. And, and again, there's more with the, the tooth and nail thing is what my head has exploded about. I didn't know about this other stuff, but 
she does not have a grip on who she is or what her standing is or ought to be in the professional wrestling industry. And that's part of the problem, too, when we talk about, I guess, partying with the wrestlers, using partying as a loose term for whatever's going on over there. It's one thing, you know, saying, hey, uh, well, I was about to say, hey, CM Punk, let's grab a drink, but that's a wrong example there. But, yeah. you know. <laughs> Remember the guy on, on, on TV offering him a beer <laughs> and you looked at him like, were you fucking insane? But, you know, it's one thing Tony Khan saying, hey, let's go smoke a joint after the show and talk about your angle or something. I'm not against that with, you know, someone high on the card, Jericho, let's say. But when you're going out with, when I say going out, when you're hanging out with anyone on the card, including people who are really low down on the card, and hanging out with them and building them up in their head and sharing drugs with them, yeah, they're going to think that, you know, you kind of fucked them over. I can understand why she thinks that. I'm not saying she's right. She didn't hear any, if no one said anything to her about her work, to the point where she was like, I'm asking, is it my work? I no Okay, one- I'm I'm jumping in here because this is these are the ones. Here's quotes. I don't know where this came from. Somebody sent this to me in an email. But she's talking about the Britt Baker tooth and nail match. I believe this is from the same interview. Big Swole okay. did an interview, and all of these quotes appear to be pulled from that same interview. So now she's talking about the tooth and nail match. Okay, well, I got this one. Quote, I was the perfect person to turn her Britt Baker heel because they didn't trust anybody else to do it because I had the most charisma. I had the most character. It's just is what it is. It's just in my nature. It's just <laughs> me. And this is how I am off screen and on screen a klutz, I guess. No. So they needed somebody that was going to one, hold their weight. And I did that. And then some, because I do my job and I'm accountable. <laughs> and so the tooth and nail match, she wasn't necessarily, she wasn't cleared. I'm going to put quotations up because it was like a gray area. I knew she could do stuff, but she wasn't cleared to have a match yet. But we were able to still do stuff. So we do cinematic. <laughs> like this girl, she'd been in the business two years. She doesn't know a wrist lock from a wristwatch, but, but we do cinematic. I wrestle in the gonzo style. Yeah. But we couldn't do any of the matches like a real match. And so we're doing this and they have everything kind of laid out in a sense. And I shit you not. I stopped production because we were in the last scene towards down the hallway before I put the syringe in. (laughs) Forgot about that. (laughs) Yeah. If you remember, yeah, the dentist got shot with the Novocaine in the now, now the syringe was her idea. So I was like, okay, we're going to do this. And I look at Kenny Omega. I was like, cause apparently now we have proper evidence to blame twinkle toes for some of this because he was there producing this he actually saw this and thought it would be a good idea for him to air it on television you remember that's when i quit watching AEW for like a month after that's this right thing. and at the time i think we only blamed tony khan and jerry lynn yes but kitty o- olivier was behind this thing now that we find out by one of the participants own lips She says, I look at Kenny. I was like, Kenny, we haven't wrestled. There's no substance to this. This is just, I don't know what this is. This is a trailer at this point, you know, because I couldn't say certain things. I couldn't make fun of her being a dentist and her doctorate because she said that's her real job. What? So we had like a mini argument about that because I was like, well, I've been making fun of you being a dentist this whole time. Why stop now? I assume there's something else that Big Swole wasn't getting, some subtle shade of something about this. I'm trying anyway. to think I'm trying to think of any time anyone has made fun of her for being a dentist, actually, and I, I can't think of any specific examples. Well, she's a heel. They ought to be they ought to be uh, plenty of people made fun of this whole fucking match and everybody involved in it. Um so anyway, so she continues, but we got to the end and I was like, can we just put a little bit more into this? A little bit more? Please, sir. Can I have some more? So I'm like, Kenny and I stopped for, it was like at least 40 minutes to try to put some type of action into it. So that's when we came in, she did the fisherman onto the floor, whatever. And we just started fighting, fighting, if that makes sense. No, it doesn't. Until we got pretty much to the end. And it was a long day. It was a really long day. It was a one day shoot. They spent a day on the worst 10 minutes that's ever been aired on a wrestling program. It was a long one-day shoot at her friend's dentist office that hadn't opened yet. (laughs) (laughs) And 
Big Swole disclosed that the whole tooth and nail match filming experience left a sour taste in her mouth because of the elements that didn't make sense. <laughs> Do you think? However, she did describe her joy for the three strikes match she had with Diamante, which she declared was her baby. Did we even see this and would we ever have wanted to? I'm fairly certain it wasn't on TV. It must have been a YouTube thing. But anyway, as far as tooth and nail, it was just, I don't know. It leaves a sour taste in my mouth because it wasn't necessarily what I wanted. <laughs> it wasn't what anybody else wanted either. She said, I didn't have reins over everything or much of anything. So now the, let's face it, the poorest performer, one of the poorest performers on the female roster, one of the newest members of the wrestling fraternity feels like that she should have control over her gimmick matches that are being presented because elsewise it leaves a sour taste in her bay. God damn, at this stage, the years, what, three, four years she's been a wrestler? 40 years ago, if you'd been a wrestler for three or four years, that meant you'd wrestled seven nights a week for the past three or four years, and you still shut the fuck up and did what people told you to do because you didn't know shit because it only been a few years. But already she's, along with her good friend Twinkle Toes and his celebrity agent Howie Feltersnatch or whatever the fuck, they're producing. They're big-time producers. They're cinematic. This, this is a byproduct of these fucking clowns being told that all their shit's good, nothing's wrong, oh, they're great, everybody deserves a chance to participate. Do you think she's someone that they should look at with control your narrative? Because she seems like she has all the ideas. She has everything figured out. Maybe she could just control her own narrative. Well, I, I, actually, they had to change the title of that company to control your reality. And then they can all tell each other, not only are our crackpot ideas, you know, valid, but we're all superstars, even though that. Almost none of us have ever had a good match or drawn a goddamn dime anywhere, or both. All right, Jim, our next question sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Stuart. I was reading an article about Triple H's fall from power in this month's Inside the Ropes magazine, and in it, it referred to Kevin Dunn and Triple H having a problematic relationship that affected the call-ups from NXT to the main roster. It implied that because of the issues, Dunn deliberately went out of his way to make wrestlers look bad to make Triple H look bad. My question to Jim is this. Would Kevin Dunn have this power? And if so, <laughs> why? W uh, why he do... All of a sudden why he do... The, la the last sentence went off the rail. And if so, why would he do... Oh, excuse me. Let me I can fix it now. And if so... Why would he do it as it seems counterproductive? Well, yes, he does have that power. And as far as why he has that power, I've never had any idea. And as far as why he would do it, it's because they're all like a bunch of fucking Republicans scampering for Donald Trump's approval up there and have been since before Donald Trump was even a thing. Everybody wants to get over with Vince. And for whatever reason, for whatever purpose, I've never understood it, Kevin Dunn's opinion is asked for, solicited, and listened to by on opinion not on television production, what he's in charge of, what he's supposed to be doing, but about wrestlers and wrestling talent. Nobody but Vince and the people that get their marching orders from Vince ever consult with Kevin Dunn on wrestlers or wrestling talent. Everybody else knows that he's a complete idiot. He doesn't know what he's looking at, and he hates wrestling to begin with. So his opinion matters not, but he thinks that the same type of people that Vince thinks should be pushed as stars should be pushed as stars. And if you don't look like or act like or talk like what he thinks that Vince would like, then if somebody else is pushing for you, he goes in and tells Vince all the negatives about that talent so that it will make him look good 
because Vince will then agree with him because he's saying all the shit that Vince thinks and has taught him. And it will, by process of elimination, ipso fatso, it will make the person that is pushing for the guy that Kevin Dunn is burying and doesn't think Vince should like, it will make him look like he doesn't know what he's talking about to Vince. So it accomplishes several things at the same time. And the byproduct of that is the byproduct of telling one of the fucking TV executives that has come out and said that they're not wrestling, that doesn't like the wrestling business, that never watched it as a fan, and all he learned about it, he learned from Vince McMahon. He gets to pick wrestlers. I've never understood. And 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 a lot of other people haven't either. Why Kevin Dunn should have an opinion on anything but television, but he does, and he gets away with it, and that's how he stays right there groveling next to Vince, like a fucking buck toothed Renfield trying to eat the last spider. Are you surprised even with that power and that role that he would, if this is true, and we've heard it before, it's not just this email, that he would aim at Triple H and the guys that Triple H is personally working with in NXT? Well, he didn't have to, he didn't have to mention Triple H's name. He just, Vince, look at this guy or look at this girl or don't you think, man, he would bring up all of the things that he would think that Vince would think is wrong with that person by looking at him. I mean, you know, I mean, it's been that way the whole time. The whole time that he's been around Vince McMahon, he will sit there and, and rub his hands together and wait for the opportunity to say something that Vince will agree with or to agree with Vince McMahon. And he's the worst enemy that the wrestling business has had in that company over these years because he, everything that we talk about sucks about wrestling today, he loves. Everything we talk about, what we used to love about wrestling, he pisses on. That's Kevin Dunn. That's why he and Shitstain got along so good. Besides them both being backstabbing social climbing pricks, they hate wrestling and love Gaga. Boy, it was a great story. At the, this was 1997, I want to say 1998. Kevin Dunn was first starting to make the big money. He's made millions since then. They've paid that little fucking muskrat a fortune. But he bought him a piece of property up in Connecticut and had a brand new big old, and you can imagine how much it cost to have a house built in Connecticut. And goddamn, which started off a legal issue that I think it, it lasted a year or more from what I remember. I may have left before it was ever adjudicated or settled, but somehow or another, the clown car construction company that he had built this house built it like five feet over the neighbor's property line. <laughs> no, I never heard that before. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. That's people were talking about it at the studio. I don't, you know. That's amazing. I, I ain't one to say it's true. You ain't heard it from me, but a lot of people were saying it. And I just got a huge tickle out of that. Well, Jim, perhaps if you were capable of going back in time, perhaps if you were, let's say, Superman or Hulk Hogan and had the ability to change time and go back in time. Reverse can, the continuum. Maybe you can go find Kevin Dunn's neighbor. And maybe you could recommend a good lawyer. <laughs> you know what? As a matter of fact, if only I had known this man... Back then, I could have put him onto Kevin Dunn's neighbor, and we could have had Kevin Dunn kicked out of the state of Connecticut. If you want an attorney that will not only fight for your rights in open court, but also kick Bucky Beaver out of the entire state, go to this man. Call Stephen P. Or two. Those are the rest. Boy, howdy, I'll tell you what. Did you see, Brian? The news came out. One of the big settlements against one of the big drug companies for the opioids. Kentucky is rolling in the money right now. Stephen P. New has a piece of that. He in, in a number of states, he's been filing these suits, the class action suits, on behalf of 
parents and grandparents and people in charge of caring for the uh, children that were born addicted to opioids because of the misrepresentations of some of these pharmaceutical companies. And it just had a big multi-hundred million dollar judgment. And of course, Kentucky and West Virginia, where Stephen is from, have been hit real hard with the opioid crisis. And so uh, as a result of that, the drug manufacturers are now being start to being held accountable for this. And that's what newlawoffice.com, Stephen P. New at 888-692-8084 can do for you if you are in that class of folks who have been harmed or affected by the opioid-addicted babies and the withdrawal from same, et cetera. The suits are currently being filed. It's multiple states. You don't have to be in West Virginia or Kentucky to be involved. And we know he answers his phone and he calls you back. So, call Stephen P. New at 888-692-8084 or drop him a line, as they say, over at newlawoffice.com. What a state-of-the-art website. I think Featherbottom was involved in that one as well. And, uh, and also, New Law Office is a title sponsor of the big reunion in round town from Big Time Wrestling and Bobby Fulton's promotions up in Circleville, Ohio. In a couple of weeks on Saturday, March 12th, I will be there in spirit. I'll be there in spirit. And other people will be there drinking spirits. So newlawoffice.com presenting you with that as well. What, what, what else can we say about a Renaissance man like Stephen P. New? He's here. He's there. He's everywhere. He's El Cabong. He may be one day defending people against your spirit. Who knows well, where you you'll be in the future? You never know about the, if you need defended against a spirit, or if you want to just get in the spirit, <laughs> whatever the case, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. We embrace Stephen, the consigliere. He's one of us. That's right, he is. And speaking of one of us, Jim, our next question, sent to corny drive through at gmail.com, comes from Danny Williams, who was one of the guest artists who contributed to the YouTube yes. channel when Travis was sick. I thought I recognized that name. A little bit of an off-topic question, but here it is from Danny. I know Jim is a big fan of George Carlin. I always appreciate Jim sprinkling in some Carlinisms from time to time. Is there a favorite routine and or special that George did over his amazing career that you like? How impactful oh. was George Carlin to Jim? And finally, did Jim ever get to see George perform live? Yes. Uh, last question first. I saw him twice here in Louisville at the Louisville Palace. I saw him in the Poconos at uh, one of the Caesars resorts. I saw him in, God, it was Las Vegas one time, was it not? Uh, why am I asking you? You weren't there. I, I wasn't there. I wish I was. Um, I wasn't even there. It was uh, Carlin. Yes, it was Carlin. Uh, but yes, I saw him live a bunch. As far as a favorite special, you know, the HBO specials, I have the entire compendium of all of his HBO comedy specials. Doing it again was great. But really, just the, the, the individual routines, my favorite one, and I had this <laughs> on my answering machine in Connecticut because I think it was 97, 98, when it came out was, uh, was when I was up there. But the routine on religion. In that, you know, God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-seeing, can do anything, but he's rotten with money. He needs money, right? <laughs> and and, and, the, <laughs> and the, the religion is the all-time undisputed king of bullshit stories. And he goes through this whole thing. It is bullshit, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And I put that on my answering machine, and Terry Funk had called me one day. He said, Corny, that's the shittiest answering machine I ever heard. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, just not only do I agree with the direction that his humor is coming from, taking the piss out of people that believe in all the stupid things that people in modern society believe in, uh, but also his the way that he worked with words. And in the immortal words of Luther Hagues, when you work with words, words are your work. Um, it just He was a wordsmith. He was a cunning linguist. The way that not only he could 
come up with the off kilter way that he looked at things that was, you know, incisive and truthful when, when he said it, you would have never thought of it otherwise till he said it, but also the way that he delivered these things and the multiple use of synonyms. I mean, when I first started cutting promos in wrestling, I kind of subliminally understood the, the, the three times rule. You know, like you're going to give three different synonyms for the same thing. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to demolish you. I'm going to destroy you, whatever the case. But he would take it to a new level and just rattle off 15 or 20 different words that you would have never strung together until he just did. And wow. And it just the crankiness, the and especially as he got older, a lot of comedians as they get older, they lose it. He got better because he stopped giving any kind of fuck whatsoever and just started really telling the truth and didn't care who he pissed off. Whereas, you know, other comedians, they they lose it or they, they get older. Look at Dennis Miller at one time was hilarious and he just turned into a miserable right-wing lunatic. But Carlin got better as he went because he finally toured the last couple of specials and the last couple of times I saw him live. You could tell he did not give two shits if anybody agreed with what he had to say because he knew he was right and he was funny and he was going to say it. And he made fun of all those fucking people. But just the, his entire delivery and the way he did things, I just... And the the extreme exaggeration and the... You know, the the characters that he created, the whole thing. Love that stuff. He w overall would have been my favorite stand-up. But, I mean, it, it, nobody else can do that. People can try to be in that vein, but it's like Richard Pryor. Is there only there only can really be one. Some of those guys that, that were so unique in in whatever era of comedy you can kind of do their stuff or you can take the flavor of their bits, but there can only be one of that guy. And that's, you know, and that's why that they would cross over at different points in time. You know, when you the Carlin and Pryor and Eddie Murphy and can, who was in that period of time from the seventies and eighties, who else was doing stadium shows as a stand up comedian? Who else was well, putting out? We'll go ahead. You know, again, it's a different kind of comedy. It's a different thing. But the first one to like sell out the garden was Andrew Dice Clay, and I know he only had a brief period where he well, yeah, was. That was that was that New York star. centric. That was a little New York centric, but too. still, it was I'll the garden. That one. But George yeah, Carlin hadn't sold out the garden at that point. Well, and he wasn't from New York. Probably didn't want to go back, knowing George Carlin. But you, but you get what I'm going with that. It was yeah. a, 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 an elite class of comics that could draw, that could sell that kind of albums and draw that kind of crowd. And that's I, and I, unrelated, but I get tickled sometimes when people today on Twitter on the social media are like, "Well, have you just know that that person has used the N word in his?" I got news for you. Every American male that was between 12 years old and 40 when Richard Pryor live on the sunset strip came out, has used the N word, whether it was in a, 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 a inflammatory or insulting or uh, hostile way. No, but they've used that word because that's how hot he was. And every routine had that word. Every major comic, when you think about it, from the 70s and 80s and early 90s, they were doing these major arena shows and the blah, blah, blah. They would have people after them for everything they ever did. Well, they weren't really doing major arenas back then. If you really what? think about it, when did they start doing major arenas? Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, they were doing huge arenas. And fucking... Uh, What's the other guy that I'm I'm blanking? But that's, but that's on. early eight. I mean, Steve Martin kind of got really popular in the late seventies. Steve 70s, Martin did him too, also. But you know, there weren't that many Steve people. Steve Martin doing. was not necessarily offensive. He wasn't offensive in any possible way. He was, you know, relatively safe, although hysterical. Not taking anything away from that. Yes. And it is funny. Again, we talked about it a few weeks ago. That one bit Eddie Murphy did, where Bill Cosby called him up to lecture him about his language yeah. and the things <laughs> he's saying. 
you know, at Richard Pryor, <laughs> tell, tell him to suck my dick. Yeah. It's what he replied. <laughs> I just watched uh, recently, funny enough, considering this question, Dick Cavett, you know, all of his stuff is finally on YouTube, or a lot of his stuff. And he had a conversation in the early 90s with Carlin after like three heart attacks. And it's amazing because just the two of them, no studio audience, having a conversation about comedy and in a lot of ways, philosophy. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. You probably would like it. It's not I, like I have not seen that. I would love to see uh, Cavett and Carlin together. I went down a rabbit hole. I started with Cavett and Carlin. And then one of the little you know, suggestions on the side was Cavett and Joan Rivers. <laughs> and then I went down a Joan Rivers rabbit hole and you forget just her whole life. She's one of the greatest comics of all time. She really is hysterical. And, but then it, it didn't translate. She's another one of those people that as she got older, it was like, eh, whereas Carlin got better. He got sharper. He got, uh, he skewered people more. Well, you know, different kind of careers. And also obviously the disaster of the Fox late night show, which, Unfortunately, even led to the suicide of her husband. I was, was about such a to say, and, and yeah. poor, what was his Edgar. name? Edgar. Edgar. And Fang. But Cabot, I went down the Cabot rabbit hole, Cabot and Robert Mitchum. Just all these amazing conversations. And no one does that today. Everyone's just playing games with celebrities, or they want to have the celebrity come on the show to play patty cake, or whatever the fuck they're doing. Jim, no love for Bill Hicks? Uh, he was, it was all right. I'm, I was, I was not, uh, I didn't follow him closely and then he was dead and people said, Oh, you must've liked Bill Hicks. I'd never really heard him until he died. Let's get another question here. Jim, obviously still to this day, Cody Rhodes is a popular topic amongst the listeners. Still to this day, after all these hours, you know, I have to say, I'm going to read this. I'm just seeing this now. Here's my exact quote from September 29th, the episode that aired. Someone, uh, Gabriel, in London, England, sent this transcription. I'm going to make a prediction right now. Cody and Brandy are going to be the first two from that initial class of upper echelon executives in wrestling to leave. And I have no doubt in my mind about that. It may happen sooner rather than later. I shouldn't say that. He still has some time left on his contract. But, mark my words, Cody and Brandy are going to be the first people gone, and very few people, outside of maybe Dustin, very few people will miss them, and they haven't really contributed as much as, let's say, even the Bucks and Omega. What does Cody do? So that was what I said on the air a few you, months before. I remember you uttering those words from your own chicken lips. It's almost as if I know what's going to happen in AEW before it happens, but I'm, I don't want to upset people who think that we don't know what we're talking about. But Jim, let's get a Cody question right here. This was sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Stephanie. Cody Rhodes was being heavily booed and wasn't getting over with the AEW crowd. Was Tony Khan to blame for that? Or was it Cody's fault? We can't say because we don't know. I think Cody has to bear some responsibility because we don't know what Tony was asking anybody to do and what was their own ideas. But we, we can't know that unless we were in the conversation or one or both of them come out and admit it afterwards. That's with Cody and Tony or anybody else and Tony. Right. But having said that, since everybody else supposedly has so much pull over what they do or how their character is presented or their finishes or whatever, you would think that Cody, being one of the highest ranking officials in the company, would have been able to say, no, it's probably not a good idea. If we do all this silly shit that we've gone over that led to the fans booing him. If he was on board with all of that, then even if Tony came up with the idea, if Cody did it all willingly, think it, thinking it was a good idea, then Cody's mostly responsible because he's the one that knows the wrestling business. Tony Khan is a rank amateur. Cody Rhodes has been around the business forever, so he should know. I'm not going to sit here and go down the whole list of what we just talked about last week on the program is the reason whether it be Brandy or the blowback from the tattoo or doing the reality TV or just sounding like a grandiose social climber. The point that I've made and I've still made is that of the 
executive vice presidents. Cody was the best in ring pro wrestler, not a fucking ballet dancing gesticulator like Twinkle Toes or not cosplaying trampoline kids like the Hardly Boys. He's had great matches and he ought to have in his head what wrestling is and how it's done. So you've taken a guy who should have been cheered by more people than the other guys because he's better at everything than they are. He's a better promo than the Bucks and Twinkle Toes. When he goes, maybe he shouldn't workshop so much, but nobody can deny he speaks better than them on television and he's a better pro wrestler. The problem has become that he basically apparently was completely blind to the way that everybody was seeing. And part of it is they don't like wrestlers in AEW, the core fan base. They like the fucking gymnasts. And he was probably going to get some blowback there. But from the, from the real wrestling fans who thought, okay, this is our sports based presentation. Not only did they not get that, but they get Cody with these ridiculous grandiose promos and the thing with Shaq and Brandy doing everything and being so not only cringeworthy, but also funny to knock it at the same time. All those things he, he let happen. And that would have been great if he'd have gone with it and turned heel and brought Brandy in to be his manager and have Brandy give Arn a nut shot. And then you may potentially have had some people coming over the rail to try to get at those two. All they had to do was, and then Cody could have been what Dan Lambert has tr been trying to be, which is the one that said, hey, I, I built this whole company. I put the whole thing together. You think these two grade school kids from Cucamonga could have done this without me? I'm the son of the American dream. And hey, Twinkle Toes, you may have some great matches in, Japan somewhere, but you couldn't hang in the big leagues. I've been there and conquered that and just be an insufferable fucking heel with an insufferable heel wife and potentially an insufferable heel baby. What, what, that, what, don't say that. You can well, make, that, fun, bring, of bring make kid, fun of the dog. Make fun of the dog. that kid out. They would have booed that kid out of the building if they'd have brought him out. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to encourage anybody to boo a dog. That's, that's just going too far. But boo that fucking kid. And they're going to say, look, he's the world's most beautiful baby. Nobody else has a baby like this. And make all the parents pissed. If he'd have done that, I'd still be on his side. But instead, they just melted down and off he went. You know, part of the problem, too, I think, despite all the other stuff you talked about, the outside of the ring stuff, like the appearance on the reality show and the TV show and just... Everything, the tattoo, forget about all that. You had a guy who came in, at least from a perception standpoint of who was starting AEW, Cody was equal footing with Omega and the Bucks. You could argue See, Jericho. I, I, well, no, you, but Jericho was way ahead of everybody. No, but everybody in terms knew who Jericho was. You could. I, I don't think you can argue that Cody wasn't a bigger mainstream star than the that's Hardly's not what i'm saying though twinkle toes i'm saying to the aw audience to the people who were there who were there from week one of dynamite cody in terms of perception cody was equal footing with the elite he was a member of the elite they were all aligned okay i'll i'll agree with you if you say to the aew faithful to the fans, AEW it, faithful. Would, it would be an insult to say he was on the same level as olivier and the hardleys to the general public he's a much bigger name than that because they'd never been on real television before However, other than the first few weeks of that show and a few other things like the pandemic speech when they had the, uh, the first empty arena show, Cody had nothing to do with Omega and nothing to do with the Bucks. It would have been a natural thing at some point. They were going to have that first War Games, remember, but the pandemic hit yeah, and they didn't have to do the Newark show. Even though the Bucks are all doing their own thing with their own friends and they stay on their, their part of the show usually... And Omega is tied in with that, but he's kind of doing his own thing with them and his friends. Should Tony Khan have said something like, look, I know you guys all want to do something with your friends, but I have Cody here and I need to do something with him. Kenny, I am going to do a program with you and Cody. Bucks, I am going to do something where you guys turn on him or he turns on you. Something. As opposed to, 
they were kind of aligned and then everyone just went their own way. And Cody was the one guy just left out in the woods. And you could blame Cody for the ideas he was insistent on doing on camera. And you could blame Tony for letting him do that. But Cody also, at a certain point, didn't have the other top guys in the company to work with. Well, but that, to me, was that was a, a bonus, not a detriment. We didn't have to see Cody interact with the Hardly Boys. What, and what would they have done? And Cody's a grown adult man, full-sized anyway. We didn't have to see Cody with Twinkle Toes, because that would have been... I don't know which one of them wouldn't have wanted to work with the other one. Twinkle Toes would know that Cody wasn't going to do a lot of his bullshit because it didn't make any sense. He'll take a big bump, as we saw in the match with Sammy. He set himself on fire. It's not big bumps. It's stupid, illogical, nonsensical, fake bumps. And would that be a clash in styles since Cody was trained in a proper way and Twinkle Toes has absolutely no basics whatsoever? Can't even fucking hit the ropes without doing a little two-step. So did either one of them want to work with the other? Would it have been a clash of styles? Would it have been a, a four-finger stinker? So I don't, I don't see why it was a detriment. Cody was out interacting with the real stars of the company and or the new upcoming stars that they <laughs> wanted to bury like Anthony Agogo. I don't think he needed to be interacting with Twinkle Toes and the rest of them. He was actually out in the broader world wrestling different people. That wasn't a problem for me. All right, Jim, our next question sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Jeremy in Minneapolis. AEW added a tornado trios match for their upcoming revolution pay-per-view featuring Matt Hardy, Andrade El Idolo, and Isaiah Cassidy versus Sammy Guevara, Darby Allen, and Sting. I have rarely seen officially designated Texas Tornado tag team matches because one, they always sucked, and two, it's lazy booking. Now people are taking your catchphrase. I was wondering if Jim had any historical knowledge of the original Texas Tornado tag team match in 1936 <laughs> when promoter Morris Siegel had the heel team of Tiger Dawa and Fazul Muhammad defeat babyfaces Henrik Milo Steinborn and Whisker Savage in Houston City Auditorium. Apparently, the match that night didn't do well either. Did other promoters or territories have crowds that actually liked these matches <laughs> instead of the better traditional tag team match? Well, again, um, when did they start calling it a Texas Tornado match? Because that's confusing the issue with the Texas Death Match. Do you remember Brian? Seventies, eighties, a lot. Sure. Of, I mean, obviously that match he talked about in Houston. They did everything in in Houston back in those days in Texas. Um, the wash, the donkey match, and the tornado match, and the tag match, and the match with the ring filled with fish and Galveston and all that other stuff. Blah blah blah. But a tornado. I, I, we used to just in uh, many territories. I used to see them billed as tornado matches. Sometimes it would be a Texas tornado match, but places where the Texas death match, the real one, was uh, established, you wouldn't want to confuse the issue. A tornado tag match means all four guys are in the ring at the same time. Nobody has to tag in and out. They start that way and finish that way. Sort of like every AEW tag team match, right? Right. But the... Uh, there have been great tornado matches and there have been horrible tornado matches and there have been tornado matches that drew and tornado matches that didn't draw. It depends on who's in it and what the context is. So there's no fast and hard, obvious rule. But as far as the, uh, the question that he's asking, besides have you ever seen a good one or one that drew, which there's, there's been numerous ones. I think the the problem is, is that, a lot of people today don't know. Uh, people were asking comments on, on the internet. Well, what wasn't a Texas death match about the Texas death match that they advertised between Adam Page and Lance Archer on AEW? They thought we said it wasn't really a Texas death match, which it wasn't. And they said, well, what wasn't a Texas death match? 
just the whole goddamn thing. But now so many people have come to the conclusion that either the matches they're seeing now, the rules that they're being fed, it's always been that way, or that somehow the rules were constant down through the years on all this other stuff where they just get confused because it's confusing because people didn't, in the territory days of wrestling, they didn't necessarily stick to the verbiage that the territory two states over was using. So a lot of things were called under different names. Remember what it, in LA they had a, used to call it a stretcher match. Now it's kind of last man standing, but it was a Roman gladiator death match. That's right. Jeff so Walton just, came up with that one. Yeah. But anyway, point being, it just depends a bit. A, a Texas death match, the rules are simple. No time limit, no disqualification, no count out, no stopping for blood. Pinfalls don't count. When there's a pinfall, each man has a 30 or 60 second rest period, and then the bell will ring to start the next fall. If a man cannot answer the 10 count to resume fighting at the sound of the bell, that's when it's over with. So it goes until one man can't continue. And Tony knows that because Tony was a tape collector or at least yes. a collector of footage. And everyone wanted that match from 86 with Lawler and Mantell against Buddy Landell and Bill Dundee. Right. But he went instead for what the New Japan fans think a Texas death match is because that's what apparently now we've found out New Japan wrestling. If they have a Texas death match, it's one fall must be won by knockout or submission, and that's it. So that's what a lot of people thought a Texas death match was, and they couldn't understand why we were so fucking pissed off that we didn't get a Texas death match. But where were we going with this? The Texas tornado match. Oh, yes. It's all four guys in the ring under whatever name. That's a tornado match. And yes, there can be good ones, and there can be stinky ones, and it depends on who's in it, how it's booked, and how it's promoted. But they're, they've been going on for a long time, and there's been success and failures. All right, Jim, our next question sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com from Ken Hudak in Marietta, Georgia. Who dat? Who dat? Who dat? Who dat talking about beating that Ken? Who dat? Who dat? Well, no one's talking about beating Ken. We have a question from Ken. I'd like to beat. I'll kick the shit out of Ken. Ken, what? don't fucking mess with me. I'll shove my foot up your ass. Will you leave Ken alone? Here's his question. Thank God it's just a foot based on this week's episode. I have a question for Jim. I have heard you say before that you consider Jim Ross to be the greatest announcer of all time. I consider him the best living announcer, but I feel Gordon Soley was the best. Can you please break down why you believe J.R. tops Gordon and what were the strengths and weaknesses between the two of them? Oh, gosh. Um, and this is not to say that, uh, oh, I think Gordon Soley sucks because I give JR the edge. And then there's Lance Russell's in that equation. And that's right. You know, and then, and honestly, just for terms of longevity and effectiveness and positive feedback from all the fans, Bob Caudill's involved. And then you can, you know, you can go to your childhood wrestling announcer dick lane in los angeles or you know ray morgan and the wwwf or whoever your announcer was all the guys that Vern had gordon Soley was very good he was very sports-like and uh, uh credible and called it like a legitimate sport the reason that i give jr the edge is because of the passion and emotion he had gordon Soley was a professor with a very professorial tone and it was natural for him and it seemed natural that he didn't get excited and every once in a while just the oh, oh you don't say type of thing was wow well gordon's he's gone crazy whereas jr could go oh, my guess god is my witness he's broken in half it was a little more drama especially for the things that were going on in like mid-south wrestling where it was violence and chaos or later on the attitude era where you know you had to have that that soundtrack of it gordon soley was he was a he was howard cosell he was a sportscaster calling a sport and wasn't going to let any 
and barely even a personal aside get in. He was the professional tone throughout. JR would bring the emotion. Lance Russell was completely different than both. And at the same time, for the product and the place that he was in, he was perfect. And they tried Gordon Soley in Memphis. He made a few. I didn't try him as the lead announcer, but he made a few appearances, especially during the Pro Wrestling USA times and some crossovers. The people wouldn't have, they liked Gordon because he was on TBS and he was a wrestling announcer from another place. They would have revolted and hung people in effigy in the streets of Memphis if they had replaced Lance Russell with Gordon Soley. They probably would have done the same thing in Florida if they'd have replaced Gordon Soley with Lance Russell. And neither guy would have gotten over on Mid-South Wrestling because Bill Watts would have probably fucking had an issue with both of them because Lance was too folksy and Soley was too detached. He wanted grit and emotion in his, in his commentary like everything else. So, And when you hear Jim Ross, that's what you're hearing because that's who trained them. Yeah. So it's time and place and and crowd and product and the whole nine yards, but I just I give JR the edge over over solely because of his passion and emotion that he brought. And even though I grew up watching Lance, and I believe I've mentioned this many times, and I will say it again, Lance Russell was the nicest human being that ever lived. I understand that he wasn't a broadcaster for national television. If he had been young enough to be in his prime during the Attitude Era, that would not have fit Lance Russell. He would have not have fit on that program because what made Lance special to the people would have, the people would have thought, well, Lance, Lance would just quit. He wouldn't be involved in shit going on like this because he was too nice a man. So it, it, each one of them, all of them that I've mentioned and more of the announcers worked in their environment with the product that they were presenting and the people that employed them and the way they were trained. But for a national pro wrestling audience, I think Jr. was the best of all the worlds when he was in that, in that zone. All right, Jim, our next question sent the corny drive through at gmail.com from Dave in the city of Ottawa. I was, yeah, you, you caught a little bullshit here a few weeks ago. You didn't, put it over any on the air but apparently did you call ottawa a country a few weeks ago on the program no i did not i was somebody said you did or was that the the complaint that they were having is that you positioned ottawa as its own standalone i don't think that's what they said and i'm not going to correct the position because i'd rather you not know exactly what i said and i don't even remember <laughs> what i said but let's get back to this question from dave in the city of ottawa I was watching an old demolition match recently and noticed Smash was wearing some pretty cool face paint. It made me wonder, were face paint guys traditionally responsible for designing and applying their own face paint? My guess is that now that WWE employs makeup artists, uh, my guess is that now, I guess he means now they, they are helped with that, but in the territory days, the guys did it all for themselves? Yes. Did they have someone else apply it for them? Did anyone ever lose a gimmick because they weren't artistic enough? Well, it, it, a lot of questions. Yet most of the guys that wore makeup, you'd see Hawk and Animal Barbarian, they'd be in the mirror painting their face. Um, Sting, and the thing is, at the Orlando Universal Studios for the TNA tapings, we would dress, well, the, the guys had trailers for locker rooms, and most of the guys would dress there, but there wasn't a real great place to paint your face or whatever. So the point is most of the guys for a bathroom would come into the bathroom in the production building where we had the production meeting room and everything. And by the time the taping was over with, I couldn't imagine not only would mama Cornette have made me go out and cut a switch and striped my legs, but just, I can't believe that universal didn't kick us out. Us, I say TNA just for the, state that the bathroom was left in and there was red and white paint and blue paint and yellow paint all over the sink from everybody painting their face and the 
toilet paper not used to wipe your ass, but just excess toilet paper and paper towels balled up, thrown everywhere, water tracked all over the floor from where they're taking showers, just chaos. Uh, but yes, the guys painted their own faces. Now, every once in a while, I've, the famous story, Lawler painted Kamala because Lawler was an artist and they gave Kamala the gimmick. It wasn't something he came up with. So Lawler started painting his face and, and then he painted stars because Kamala's a Ugandan warrior, right? And he's thinking, well, the warrior in the nighttime and everything. So he paints stars and moons on Kamala's chest and stomach, a half moon and a couple of white stars and everything. And Kamala goes and looks in the mirror and go, King, why'd you paint a banana on my stomach? He thought the half moon was a banana and he was a, a racial connotation. <laughs> Jerry said, that's a moon sugar bear. Anyway. So, but mostly, yes, the guys painted their own face and they came up with it and they didn't, I mean, it uh, being artistic helped a bit, but they didn't have to be necessarily real artistic because they weren't like recreating some famous painting. They were just painting their face in a way that they came up with. So who's going to tell them it's wrong. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, if they don't stay in the lines real good. It might look sloppy, but that as it's like if Vince McMahon wrestles at WrestleMania, I'm afraid his makeup is going to smear off and then we'll see what he looks like under the mask of Dorian Gray. But yeah, the guys did their own makeup and, 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 you know, had to carry that shit around and wipe it off and everything. That's why Sting started charging an extra five grand here a few years ago. If he does autographs, he'll wear the sunglasses. If he got to paint the face, it's another five grand. Did you have a favorite? Is there one guy that you actually liked the face paint on? Um, I mean, I, I accepted it with the road warriors because that was part of their gimmick and it didn't look you know, nothing about them looked funny. <laughs> or if it did to you, you'd kept it to yourself. You certainly wouldn't tell them. Uh, but it just, the face painting became such a goddamn thing when, uh, again, like the Rock and Roll Express, they got over and led to, you know, the imitators, the Midnight Rockers, and the, the Rock and Roll RPMs, and the Stop and Go Express, and whatever. When the Road Wars got over and the Ultimate Warrior up north, it led to everybody painting their face, which is why I banned face paint in Smoky Mountain Wrestling because it was a symbol of gaga bullshit entertainment wrestling at that point. It wasn't bad when the first, like everything else, it wasn't bad when the first guys that were real stars did it. And then everybody, the same, it goes back to masked wrestlers. Masked wrestlers, at one point, the reason why that there were a bunch of them is because they had traditionally drawn drawn money going back to the mass marvel in at the opera house in philly in the fucking 19 teens or whatever um but then the promoters especially nick Goulas, this was his thing figured out well i can take guys that i can pay as little money as possible to and put them under mass and make the masked guys over but i can they can be interchangeable under the mask or i can use the undocumented mexicans and pay them very little money or whatever and the mass got prostituted to the point where mass became synonymous with job guys because every fucking jack off job guy had a mask right so then it meant nothing and and all the guys like Mr. Wrestling 2 and the Destroyer and Mil Moscaris fucking loathed that kind of shit because they'd gotten the mask over to mean their their careers, and then these other guys are just wiping their ass on it. It's the same thing with face makeup. It's the same thing with teams called the Express, whatever. It starts out with somebody, one or two people gets it over, then everybody starts doing it, and then it becomes so done to death that it's synonymous with job guys. Well, speaking of job, guys, our job is over, guys. Hey! We're going to wrap this show up. But, Jim, as we begin to wrap things up, the drive through is closed. I have a good name for Cody in WWE. What's that? You know what they call the Rice Krispie Treat at Starbucks? I have no idea. The Marshmallow Dream. <laughs> 
What a great name. Of course, we'll be back this weekend on the Jim Cornette Experience, wherever you find your favorite podcast. I have never set foot in a Starbucks in my life. Never been inside one. Well, you hate coffee. Yes. It would probably be hell for you to go into a place that's nothing but, well, primarily coffee. The stench-ridden place that it is. Of course, the Jim Cornette Experience this weekend. We'll be back next week here on the drive-thru for more gerbils and coffee and so much more. Wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Get access to the archive of shows going back to the beginning in 2013. Patreon.com slash Cornette. For $5 a month, you get access to that archive of the drive through and the experience going back to the beginning. Patreon.com slash Cornette. Don't forget to subscribe to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll be the very first thing that pops up. Full episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections. If you hear something that you enjoy on the show and you want to share it on social media, go right to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel with that very popular Travis Heckle artwork. Right to it. Right to it. Also, you can write to Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. <laughs> you can write to me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. You can call Brian Last on the phone personally at one. Stop, stop, three, stop, four, stop, uh, stop, stop. But while we're on the topic of things people should write down, don't forget to write down Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. What's going on over there? Well, lots of stuff, and the feather <laughs> bottoms are busy, and they're going to be even busier this coming Saturday, March 5th at noon Eastern when the last less than 400 Christmas variant action figures go on sale, never to be duplicated again. Get them while they last. At jimcornette.com. Of course. Or call Brian Last at 1. Stop, stop, Three, stop. Four. If you do oh. that one more time, I'm going to suggest the audience calls this man. The man who sponsors the drive through Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until next week on the drive through and this weekend on The Experience, I'm rattled because he's reading off my phone number. For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Yeah.